back to our questions around 464 and 808. Um, we had some time yesterday to talk about data, um, and today I'd like to talk about uh, training and data with the folks who are here in the room. Um, and so I'm going to ask Ingrid Jonas to come and join us first. Do you have anything online? Uh, I do not. I have some things to hand out, okay. but I, yeah. So not put snacks right in front of me during. <laughs> Boy, won't you feel welcome? Thank you. I bought a giant bag. <laughs> I saw that. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. We're not kidding. <laughs> right. The raisin, the milk chocolate raisins are preferable, but I guess yeah. M&Ms are. We're talking a lot of cannabis today. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, for the record, Major Ingrid Jonas, Vermont State Police. Um, I'm a division commander. Um, also with me today is Captain Gary Scott, who is the director of Fair and Impartial Policing, and also Betty Wheeler, who's our data analyst. Um, for Department of Public Safety, in addition to other roles. Um, so I, I've prepared notes because that's sort of easier for me, but um, definitely want people to ask questions at any time um, during. Um, it helps me to stay focused if I have notes to refer to. Um, so just for some background, Vermont State Police provides primary law enforcement services to 200 towns approximately in Vermont. 90% uh, of the land mass of Vermont and 50% of the population. Um, our dispatchers ans answer roughly 89% of 911 calls in addition to all sorts of other calls. Um, we have 334 sworn members in our department and around 64 emergency dispatchers and civilian staff um, that cover our three sections, support services, field force, and criminal division. So field force is the uh, officers who you see on the roads in, the, in marked cars, criminal division, plain clothes, detectives. Um, my division is support services, training, recruitment, fair and impartial policing, um, internal investigations, and other infrastructure and operational support to the department. Um, what we refer to as fair and impartial policing, that mission is a fundamental principle to our department and has been for quite some time. Um, and it's really fundamental in that we derive our power from the people that we serve. And without the trust of the people that we serve, we are ineffective as police officers. Um, our job is to promote um, safety in the community. And without trust, we, we can't be effective in our work. Um, so the work that we do to ensure that our practices are ethical and fair is, goes way beyond traffic stop data collection. Um, and is really a, a systemic practice and uh, value system that we're always working on from our hiring and selection process all the way through things like traffic stop data that helps to give us a diagnostic test of how we're doing and what we're doing in the field. Um, I also want to start out by saying that any police action or inaction that is based on stereotyping is completely unjust, ineffective, and um, frankly unsafe, and goes against the Constitution and department policy. Uh, it's a fireable offense to use stereotyping of any sort to derive your law enforcement practices. Um, traffic stops and tracking those are one small part of um, the overall safety work that we do in Vermont State Police. So, for frame of reference, in 2018, because I don't have 2019 numbers yet, um, we made approximately 58,000 traffic stops. At the same time, we responded to just under 60,000 total calls for service. So 58,000 car stops, 60,000 calls for service. By calls for service, I mean responding to uh, burglaries, domestic assaults, uh, DUIs, etc. So about 1,000 domestic violence-related reports, um, 1,000 burglary reports, 1,100 DUI cases, 7,000 uh, alarm calls. Um, in the PSAP, the, the dispatching center in Williston, we responded to 141,000 911 calls. In the Westminster PSAP, we responded to 143,000 911 calls. Um, getting back to data collection with regard to traffic stops, um, 
So in 2009, we formed um, what is still known as the, the Fair and Impartial Policing Committee, which was basically a collaboration between community members and sworn members in our department to try to answer widespread concern about bias-motivated policing, in particular racially motivated car stops. Um, we wanted to see if there was a scientific way to take a look at um, determining if there was a cause and effect correlation between a driver's race and the vehicle stopping patterns of police officers in our department. Um, we wanted to know, does a driver's race or ethnicity or even other you know, personal characteristics have a causal impact on decisions made by troopers in the field? That's what these studies are meant to um, look at. So as folks know, that effort resulted in the development of data collection forms and um, the methods that were um, initiated in around 2009 in Vermont, uh, Vermont State Police in particular. Um, and I should note that that committee is still in effect, has broadened its mission, still is attentive to our traffic stop data and acts as an advisory group to state police. Um, I think you know, because the commissioner has testified here before, that we commissioned a national expert, Dr. Jack McDevitt, from Northeastern University to help us with our traffic stop data. Um, through that, we learned that what these data studies are supposed to do is take a look at discretionary car stops. So some of our car stops are considered discretionary, and others really aren't. Um, but the idea being that when you have discretion, do you have any patterns or tendencies in terms of how you measure out tickets versus warnings or car searches versus other actions that you take um, in that capacity? Um, so on the back of the Vermont traffic ticket, yes, please. No, it's fine. Is, is the reason that we're focusing on traffic stops because there's some discretion? on law enforcement's part versus when you re respond to a 911 call, yes. there's no discretion? That's correct. Okay. So, But it's important to kind of look at the nuance of that. So when you talk to troopers in the field, when I was a road trooper, if somebody was going 90 miles an hour and I was sitting in a U-turn clocking radar, using radar, gosh, that was a long time ago, but in any case, if somebody was going 90 miles an hour, I didn't feel like I had the option, like, meh. I'm too busy right now on my phone. Nothing like that. 90 miles an hour, you feel that that is your job. You need to stop that person. It's unsafe. Um, but in general, um, we do, you know, even just driving here, three cars pass me. Sure, I could have decided to stop one. I had another place to be and purpose, so I didn't. So, yes, car stops tend to be looked at as discretionary to some extent. And then, certainly, once you have a car stopped, um, you do have an amount of discretion in terms of whether you issue a ticket, whether you issue a warning, or um, one of each, so that type of thing. How you handle what it is that you find after you've stopped the car. Is that answer? Okay. Um, so we are, we were intending um, to study our discretionary actions as a result of stopping cars. Now we made some pretty big mistakes when we uh, because we use the ticket itself for discretionary um, actions and others. This ticket is, is, is a universal um, document. This is the ticket that we were using for, the, you know, for a number of years, and it has a section here, and I can circulate this if that's helpful, because I don't know if folks have had a chance to take a look at a ticket. Um, but you'll see that there's a section on the ticket. So after a trooper would stop the car, um, pardon me? Yeah, okay, right. So um, you'll see that there's a section on the right hand panel where after the car stop is complete, the trooper would check a bunch of boxes. So what is the trooper's perceived race of the operator? What was the reason for the stop? And what were the actions taken? And what was the outcome? Um, at the end of that. Now, we use this traffic ticket for discretionary car stops, but we also use it when we issue a ticket for something that is non-discretionary. So we're dispatched to a car crash, and we learn that the driver um, had no valid license or was exceeding the speed limit and caused the crash. So those 
tickets issued as a result of a non-discretionary um, response also got thrown into the mix. And that's just a kind of a side note, because what we did was we submitted six years of raw data, which was about um, 291,000 um, traffic tickets representing car stops. Uh, and a number of those were thrown into the mix that were non-discretionary because we used that document for discretionary and non-discretionary ticket-related activity. Um, but folks know that in 2016, Dr. McDevitt and, and Dr. Stephanie Seguino from UVM both did analyses of our um, traffic stops with regard to racial demographics and dis um, disparate impacts of those. Um, <clears throat> yes, please. Sorry. No, that's fine. Um, this question was asked yesterday as far as how was the, the data that you're looking to collect, how does it determine what's on the ticket, what gets asked? Right. Um, so I was not part of the initial efforts to create those that data collection section on the ticket. It's something that, in hindsight, I wish had been done in a more thoughtful way. But those categories are representative of what um, the statute now asks. So there are categories, gender, age, perceived race, reason for stop, search, and overall outcome of the stop. So it's generally statute driven as opposed to currently internal. it's statute driven. Um, correct. Thank you. That's a good question. That's something that um, I think could have been done in a more comprehensive, far looking way in the beginning, but that's just my opinion. Um, <clears throat> so as you know, good quality data is a prerequisite for outcomes that you can really learn something from. In the early efforts, there was no mechanism in Vermont for a standardized way of looking at how to check those boxes. So we heard about um, everything from troopers leaving the perceived race blank because they really didn't want to make an assumption about somebody's race to um, checking boxes based on the outcomes that they had with passengers that they um, engaged with at the traffic stop, when really these types of data collection efforts are really only to be focused on the operator um, in the vehicle. So again, concern around standardized ways of looking at the, the box checking effort. It's very important that we're all measuring the same sorts of things. Um, so <clears throat> I think it's also commonly known that um, after we have the analysis done of our initial six years, um, including all the error data in there, we learned that um, we searched cars at around the rate of one out of 90 cars. <laughs> so one out of 90 cars that we stopped were searched. Um, our overall hit rate, which was a new term that a lot of us hadn't known of, but the hit rate is what's referred to as the um, when contraband is found in a car search. So contraband could be anything from checking the box because you had an underage driver who had cigarettes, which were illegal, to stolen property from a from a um, burglary or heroin. So there was really we didn't we weren't delineating between what type of contraband, but we were checking the box for contraband. Um, <clears throat> our search disparities um, with regard to race over the time frame of 2010 through 2015 showed that they grew. Um, it, specifically, our numbers show that we searched black motorists and Latino motorists at a higher rate than we searched white and Asian motorists. At the same time, though we had very high hit rates, so 78% of the time when we searched a car we found contraband. Um, we learned that we found more contraband when we searched white and Asian drivers than when we searched black and Latino drivers. Um, since that time, I, it's important to say that we have done an enormous effort um, with a lot of help from 
outside and inside assistance and consulting to clean up our data, meaning to make sure that what we are analyzing is actually representative of what we're trying to analyze. Discretionary car stops, actions only taken with the operator as opposed to conflating operator and passenger activity and so on. Um, and this is a commitment we made because Again, it really all boils down to trust and willingness to work with your community on something that's important. Yes. Um, is this still the only source, or I mean, everybody has in-car? Well, so everybody, you mean in-car cameras and those sorts of things? No, like okay. data collection. I mean, if you link the ticket to a, a, the statute describes what must be on here, mm -hmm. you have an elective ability to and more data collection Correct. through your... Right, so this is, we've expanded the data collection. Okay. So we also collect um, passenger-related um, information and actions with passengers. And we also have provided to analysts when they've requested it, the breakdown of the type of contraband that we <coughs> find. It takes a lot of work because it's not written on the document itself, but we can, we can go through and do that when we need to. Ticket-based, or is it computer-based on a big um, You mean contraband? No, or? just the expanded data collection. It's ticket-based, or e-ticket-based, depending on what method the trooper is, or the officer is using. And then that's entered into our records management system by admin staff. Um, so, Let's see. So we've increased our accuracy in terms of data entry um, and the intended message for these types of efforts in the field by doing um, training, policy um, improvement. Um, and by training, I mean training the field and also our admin staff to understand really what is the mission here. Um, we also have an auditing process that um, Betty can talk more about if you want, but it's something that um, we didn't have in the past and that has really um, resulted in much cleaner and accurate data. The uh, audits occur quarterly. Um, so after the auditing process is done and the year ends, we then go through and clean up all the errors, get rid of all the duplications, um, any blanks that we can eliminate, we get, we, and then we meet with our fair and impartial policing committee in June of every calendar year, <coughs> and then announce and produce our data to the public after presenting it to our committee. <coughs> Correct. Oh, sorry. Who sits on it? I'm sorry. Who sits on that? I'm sorry. Um, so we have a number of command staff and um, troopers at all ranks, and then a num like a, a very diverse range of leaders in Vermont or just citizens who care about these issues. Um, we coach. The committee is co-chaired by myself and Dr. Aton Nesredin Longo, who um, is the uh, well. He's a professor at um, a college in southern Vermont, but he's also the chair of the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System um, pan, uh, panel. And he's been part of the committee for quite some time. Um, I can give you a list of all of the members, but... If Alexa was here, um, mm -hmm. he would have answered that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. That's okay. okay. Um, so in 2016, State Police created a new position in the Director of Fair and Impartial Policing and Community Affairs. And the focus of that position, it's really the first, we're the first department we know of to have created a specific position, is to really work with all levels of the department to ensure fair and impartial policing at every <coughs> level. So I mentioned earlier, but it really boils down to what kind of values you put forth as an agency from how you select applicants and to all the way through your policy or procedure, how you message the data collection effort and its importance in the, in the scheme of things. So um, that position has been around since 2016. Um, one of the issues that we 
had concern about, and again, we're troopers, we're not data experts, but um, Jack McDevitt used crash data as the baseline or benchmark for from which to compare our data to in those initial studies. And it's something that we think is really important to get right. What is the baseline that your department's data is being compared to? And that answers the question of who is driving in Vermont. So it's really important that there be a way for us to get correct who is driving in Vermont so that an agency's data can be compared against that um, accurately and fairly. So a lot of times I hear when I go to meetings or public forums, there's an assumption that um, who lives in Vermont should be represented of a who's driving in Vermont. And officers don't agree with that assumption. Um, you can't just simply take a look at census data and say, well, that should represent who's driving on the roads, because that doesn't account for all sorts of other things. Um, and the other thing that's been, so crash data is what Jack McDevitt used. He took a look at Agency of Transportation crash data and said that people who crash on the roads are representative of who drives. And, that, and that's probably true, you know, to some extent. But my point is simply, I don't know what the exact answer is, what the baseline should be, but it needs to be accurate so that we can really learn um, what our numbers show around stopping vehicles. Um, because if you don't know who's driving, how do you know um, what your stop data is indicating? So if I, you know, I used to patrol up in Franklin County, if I happen to be patrolling within 10 miles of the Highgate border crossing and stopping only cars for excessive, you know, exceeding the speed limit, and then my supervisor would take a look at my data and say, wow, do you have a bias against Canadians? You're stopping a disproportionate number of Canadians compared to other drivers or, or Vermont residents. And then my supervisor would say, oh, well, the alternative um, factor is that you're patrolling in an area that has is is you know um, over representation of Canadian residents. So those types of things have got to be considered. Um, another, you know, other other sorts of questions that need to help us answer: Does a driver's race or ethnicity or other personal characteristics have a causal impact on the decisions made by officers? As um, people who drive more are at higher risk of being stopped by police. People who drive poorly are at a higher risk of being stopped by police. People who drive in locations where police tend to stop cars more frequently are going to be at a higher risk of being stopped by police. And people who drive vehicles with visibly defective equipment tend to be stopped at a higher rate by police as well. Um, so another thing that I want to point out is that for state police, and I know other agencies have this as well, a robust complaint and internal investigation system should be in place because things like discrimination are unlawful and need to be addressed head on by the agency. So. I like to bring up this aspect of our agency because it is an important accountability component and an internal checks and balances. Um, so our complaint um, and internal investigation process is overseen by the Commissioner of Public Safety as well as a civilian <laughs> review committee called the State Police Advisory Commission. Um, our policies and procedures include a requirement that all members report any wrongdoing or misconduct of other members. Um, it's a Part A violation if you fail to report and know about a um, misconduct violation or allegation of a member in our department. Um, in 2017, we had, I want to give you a sense of the numbers of complaints we get regarding discrimination. And I'm not saying there aren't a number of complaints every year of all sorts of categories. but. Um, we, in 2017, the commissioner opened 
an investigation for a discrimination um, allegation. It was investigated and unfounded. We had zero complaints of discrimination in 2018. We had one complaint of discrimination in 2019 that was um, investigated and unfounded. Discrimination in our code of conduct is a Part A violation, again, one of the most serious, um, and it states no member shall discriminate in favor of or against any person or other member on the basis of race, religion, politics, national origin, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, lifestyle, or similar personal characteristics. Um, I, real, I sort of wanted to set that context, but now I want to talk about some of the tools and early intervention systems that we've set up in state police regarding traffic stop data. Um, so we have training at every level around um, bias, unconscious and conscious forms of bias. Um, the traffic stop data that you've looked at is submitted um, along with um, through the ticket or e-ticketing system to admin staff for entry. Um, our analyst does quarterly audits of our records management system checking uh, radio logs to see how they match up with the tickets themselves. Um, to make sure that the tickets or warnings that are issued match what is in the radio log. Um, if there are errors, she generates a report, and those reports go directly to the 10 station commanders around the state whose responsibility it is to get answers and clean those things up. Um, admin staff have had training of, um, to do proper collection and data entry. Um, from the months of January to May, the analyst verifies um, the data, cleans and eliminates duplicates, errors, and fill, gets the station commanders to fill in any missing entries. As I mentioned earlier, we then release the data publicly in June. Um, we post it on our web page, um, and we also provide it to Crime Research Group as part of the statute. Um, we then work with the co-chair of the Fair and Impartial Policing Committee to help us determine from our total order, our total organization, folks who are out patrolling, here are our stats. What should the number be that would result in a trooper being called in to meet with, say, a supervisor to discuss what their racial demographics show in their traffic stops? So, um, I believe that last year um, we gave station commanders the directive based on input from the committee that troopers with car stops above 6% um, where the motorist is perceived as a person of color would come in, would take a look at their data with their supervisor, would do some spot checks of their videos and audios of their car stops to try to determine if there was any uh, discriminatory behavior behind the disparities. So a lot of times we find that racial disparities in people's minds are synonymous with racial discrimination. And that hasn't um, been always been the case when we look into traffic stop data. So there can be a disparity, um, but is it driven by discrimination? If it's driven by discrimination, then it needs to be swiftly addressed. But when you take a look at people's videos of their car stops or their searches, and you find that those stops and searches are based on reasonable suspicion or probable cause, then you have um, what is the requirement for a car stop or a car search. So. Having those conversations with troopers needs to be done in a respectful and appropriate way because there is a difference between types of disparities and improper practice or discrimination. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you threw something out there that uh, I don't know what it meant. Oh. Uh, correlating the radio data? What comes over the radio data that would be inconsistent with the so radio logs show, um, and and I might have to have Betty specify it, but what I can tell you is that um, like a radio log will show that 
a trooper stopped a car for speeding, let's say, and yet there's no ticket associated with that engagement. So when you dig deeper, you find that the trooper stopped the car for speeding, but then learned that the driver was, um, that he or she had suspicion the driver was under the influence, and then ultimately arrested that driver didn't issue a ticket or a warning because it resulted in an arrest. So they didn't pile on other th sorts of things. However, Vermont statute requires that for every roadside stop, there's a ticket or a warning where data is collected. And so that still needs to be counted as a roadside stop or else it goes unnoted. So radio logs can help um, cross-check um, those types of events that stops happened, but no pa paperwork represented the stop. And it's both the arrest and the get out of jail free. You can you can go sort of thing. I'm sorry, I don't know if I understand the question. Well, I'm mean, a warning. Hmm? You're a warning. No, not a warning. Just no record whatsoever. Well, no. So there needs to be a way to document that yeah. event. So. Um, well, so the radio log shows that there was a car stop, yeah. but there isn't a, a subsequent ticket or warning associated with it. There's just an arrest. There needs to be a way to document those statutorily required boxes. Jim Howland, GP. Major. Um, it sounds like you have a pretty uh, uh, full review um, and look at your data, um, but you mentioned a little while ago about um, reviewing uh, instances that might show a bias from the officer. Um, what do you do in those cases? Well, um, I can tell you that we don't have a lot of those cases, so it's not something that we're experts at, that we can reach a firm conclusion that the trooper's actions are driven by bias or discrimination. So it's not a common occurrence that we're reaching that conclusion. If that were to be the case, that would be um, at, you know, it's a, po it's a serious policy violation. Um, Bias-based policing is a, is a form of discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, it's grounds for termination. Um, we, um, we would try to <laughs> fix that person. Um, if, and if, that was, if we were able to fix that person and through training and um, other forms of remediation, then we would do that. Um, if the person was not fixable, then we would follow the due process and terminate them from working for us. So how often do you um, have your troopers go through implicit bias training? Well, we have a number of different stages in which troopers at different ranks and levels go through training. So in the pre-basic, which is the very first phase once they've been hired and they're in a three-week initial phase of our training, they are, uh, Gary meets with them as well as um, a member from our Fair and Impartial Policing Committee to talk with them about the overall mission of the department and how Fair and Impartial Policing is fundamental to our practice. Um, that is a two-hour block of instruction for just like the 20 new recruits that are in, the, in our part of the academy. In the basic academy, I see that uh, Director Cindy Taylor Patch is here and can talk more about what is um, the way that fair and impartial policing is, is um, infused in all of the mm -hmm. basic training. In our post-basic for state police, we have an eight-hour block on fair and impartial policing that we that is led by um, Captain Scott and also a consultant that we work with, um, who's a you know someone who helps our department on the whole in this area. So it's an eight-hour block of instruction for troopers who have graduated but they are not yet out in the field. 
Um, and then I am trying to figure out how many hours annually is required. I think that I will defer to Cindy for what's required of all officers um, for the state of Vermont. But VSP, again, we have a consultant whom we pay who works with, you know, comes to command staff meetings and does a, a one or two hour block of instruction. Um, and we're able to send Gary out to do barracks level trainings um, on, say, proper collection of hate motivated or bias motivated crime and how to investigate those differently um, and in, in a more broad way. So we we have Gary and others at our disposal to send out at a barracks level. Um, so it would be hard to quantify, you know, four hour block here, two hour. Um, it's, and again, we don't want to look at it as like checking the box. This trooper did one hour of you know, bias-free policing training online. We don't see that as as a um, comprehensive enough way to mm -hmm. sort of tackle this mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier from 2010 to 2015, there was a growing disparity of police stops based on race. So Stops and cer uh, I'm, searches. Searches. Yeah. So what's the current trend? So I still, we don't have the 2019 data all cleaned up yet, but we have 2018, 17, and 16. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to share that with the committee as well. So the first page is 2018. So if you go down here, the searches, total stops with searches, you see that midway down the first page? So total stops with searches, and it goes by demographics. So 322 white operators were searched, 25 black operators were searched, five Asian operators were searched, 15. Hispanic or Latino operators were searched. Zero Native American operators were searched. For a total of 367 total stops with searches in 2018. And then you can follow down through and see the results of those searches. So if you take a look at um, Asian operator searches, there are five um, Five of those, five out of five resulted in evidence or contraband found. Two out of those five resulted in an arrest. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom, out of those five total for the year, that indicates that 100% of Asian motorist searches resulted in contraband being found for a search rate of 0.41. Um, for Asian motorists. And you can do the same for whites, blacks, Asians, Hispanics, Native Americans. So you see our search rate for whites is a percentage, is percentage-wise less than our search rate for blacks and Hispanics as well. Can you see that on the bottom? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> I had a couple questions on the actual tickets and things, and got more into the got off, off track. But this is my turn. If we can go back to sure, to, real quick. Um, you you advised uh, Major that the uh, state law requires. The, uh, I want to clarify the two bodies that the traffic stop and, and uh, uh, racial data is documented. Correct. So, having said that, is there a policy that with VSP now that yes. a written warning has to be given uh, versus a verbal warning? And the reason I ask that is if you have a written warning, you have 
written documentation of the racial data collected or a verbal, you might not. And I question how a radio log would have that racial data. Is he going to get that? So I is there a so. policy that you have a written warning or you have to get something in writing so you can document or yes. if not? But go ahead. So there, so there's policy, and I don't, I don't have it memorized, but the policy states that we don't give verbal warnings. Okay. Okay, and, and that, I think that's a good idea myself. Uh, it's is most PDs in the state have that same policy because that's not law, right? But yeah, I'm not sure if they do. Mm. I I think it's hard <clears throat> to say because there's so many different PDs, but our department has a policy that no written warnings will be given. Okay. So when you're referring to, you're comparing the... the uh, Verbal warnings, I should say. Uh, Thank you. The number of stops and things by radio logs. Uh, in there, because there was no paperwork issued on it. Paperwork being, being your, um, your ticket. Correct. Or, or a written warning, uh, different form, obviously, issued because you arrested somebody like on a... DUI or something, whatever. But if you stopped me for for something, and I didn't get arrested or cited in the, in the criminal court for something, uh, I would have at least a written warning. Correct. That's the that's what policy says. Okay. Yes. Okay. And that's good. And then just a little off the thing. I, do you guys have you have any tickets now? So do all your cruisers have uh, ticket printers? Or? Or not. For, um, phasing them in. Yeah, so our fleet staff has been phasing in the printers and the other equipment necessary for and I for e ticket and I can't remember if we've completed every single barracks or not, but we're getting close. Is it saving time? Uh, to trooper to, to sit there on a laptop and do I the think entry it and does. or I, the equipment right. It must. I mean that's one of the especially for for when you're writing multiple documents, like if there's three tickets or a ticket and two warnings, you don't have to go through and manually. <laughs> or auto populate the, the basic data to just put the events in there. Correct. Good idea. Thank you. Rob? Um, could we back up to the, the search rates? Yep. I'm, I'm curious if when does age come into part of the equation about whether you're going to search or not in that we all know that Vermont has an aging demographic and it would make sense that you're going to stop more whites and people of color because that's how our population is but the decision to make to do a search in other words like I have a 98 year old grandmother who still drives and if she was to get pulled over I'm assuming that an officer probably wouldn't be so apt to look for contraband or had go through that thought process with her as they might with, you know, a 20-something year old person? Does that? Well, so I can tell you that age should never be a driving reason mm -hmm. for why you would, it, it's not a, that's a, another personal characteristic that isn't a driving reason behind determining reasonable suspicion or probable cause to mm -hmm. take an action, you know, there are other things that need to be in place in order to give you what you lawfully need to do a search, which is really a seizure of somebody. It's not taken lightly, and it needs to be very much based in um, those lawful reasons, reasonable suspicion and probable cause. But in general, I mean, sure, if, if I were to stop your 98-year-old grandma then I wouldn't necessarily be my first thought wouldn't be I wonder if she has stolen property do you know what I'm saying yeah. um, if there was a TV in the back seat I wouldn't assume that it was you know stolen from somewhere mm -hmm. um, I would hope that I wouldn't assume that when I stopped anybody but mm -hmm. probably because I'm human mm -hmm. I wouldn't assume that correct and so it, that's a good point it brings up a point at least to me that as human beings, we all have these types of, our brains want to work in this way of like putting people into neat little boxes and stereotypes um, based on basically how we look. <laughs> and it's pretty, um, there, there's, sometimes it can be, 
helpful, right? Because it helps us make sense of the world quickly and instead of having to just take every single situation with a total blank slate. Um, however, it can also lead us to make grave errors if we're operating only on our assumptions. So looking at this, looking at 2018, how would you interpret your findings and then um, what would the follow through be? You know, we're collecting data and then we're using it to, for training purposes and for um, certainly to know more about stops, but if you could elaborate on that, I'd appreciate mm -hmm. it. So our station commanders have to own the data. So they have for each barracks, they have this sheet for their own barracks with a breakdown of their members. And they can take a look and in theory they could see if there was someone who looked like an outlier whose traffic stop stops and or searches looked outside of the norm for that barracks. And they would, it would be incumbent upon them to look into that further, pull videos from, that, from searches or car stops, um, listen to interactions, sit down with a trooper and talk about what their method is for ticketing versus warnings or ensure that they are following proper procedure around decision making for, for car searches. Um, so each barracks commander has this but for their barracks itself. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they work with their patrol commanders, supervisors, to look at troopers and bring them in if necessary and talk with them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Would additional training be required for a member who has data that's being an outlier? So um, it could be. So we found... Um, I was actually the person who went around the state when we first had the, the six years of data, the initial effort that I talked about with Dr. McDevitt, um, where we decided as senior command that any trooper with 4% minority stops or above would come in and meet with me <laughs> and have a discussion. And I wouldn't want to take up all your time today talking about what that was like, but it was challenging. It, those weren't easy conversations. Um, but um, the outcome could result in training. The outcome could result in, um, you know, you, you can find all kinds of things when you look at um, the way that people engage with the public in traffic stops, and they might need... Um, to be reminded that we follow this procedure when we engage with motorists. One example is that we, it used to be that you stop a car and say, do you know why I stopped you? And it, um, we received a lot of feedback um, through our FIP committee that that is sort of a dehumanizing, uncomfortable thing. In fact, it's better if you state why you stop the person right out of the gate instead of having that awkward tension and people wondering what's happening. It's, it's, um, it, it's fear inducing. Mm -hmm. So um, we could learn through looking at videos that, wow, this trooper is not following that procedure well, or that trooper is doing a great job with that procedure, getting right out of the mm -hmm. gate. I stopped you, you know, Trooper Inger Jonas, I stopped you for speeding. Um, I'd like to have a look at your license, registration, and insurance. So you get that out of the way right away. So something as simple as just, is the trooper following what is now policy for the engagement when you do make a car stop, all the way up to, wow, the trooper needs um, better guidance on the steps for conducting a search and establishing probable cause for a search. Um, and that would be something that is more um, extensive, mm -hmm. training around proper search and, and seizure and so on. Did you find that um, this extra training and the meetings with the officer resulted in, uh, in a positive result that uh, their rates dropped after that? Um, what I, f I think that we're going to see that over time. What we found was that 
the standardization of checking boxes and making sure that traffic stop um, that the that discretionary car stops are the ones in which you're submitting um, the data is um, that message is clearer but these things are taking time um, so I think that yes but that it will take we'll need to see a lot more years and a lot more um, data to show how it pans out in general officers don't really like to be called in to meet with a supervisor sure. and um, and talk about this kind of thing and that these are men and women who take a lot of pride in the work they do and who um, who understand that without the trust of the public we can't do our work effectively and so it goes to like your heart to think like that something about your numbers indicate something discriminatory it's not it's not um, it's it's not a great meeting to have or to be part you know to be part of but it does lead to good discussions um, and you know it's growing pains and culture change basically yeah, Major, you, I, I mean, I commend you for looking at this, studying it, following up, doing all that you're doing. And maybe this is an unfair question to you, um, but you are fortunate in that you have a large organization and you have folks like yourself that can devote some time to this. One of my towns has a two-person police department. How do they do this? Um, well, I mean, I hear you, and I think that we, it's, it's, if there's a standardized way of understanding what the mission is for, what we're trying to, if we have a common goal, we want transparency, we want fairness, here's how you accurately check the boxes so that you don't make mistakes, um, and then I mean, a two-person department in, a, I assume, a small town, you have to also understand, through experts, are these statistically significant numbers? Can we really learn something from this? Is this enough? Are we making enough car stops? Is there enough um, you know, diversity in this particular area for us to learn something from this? So I think... You know, it's state law that we collect this stuff, but then we need to, uh, and we need to understand the importance of the mission, but then we need experts to tell us, does this teeny town, can we learn a lot from this teeny town's data? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're doing a lot of look from the troopers into the, what they do, and it seems like you're starting to do a lot of look into why they do. You just talked about correlation with people who stand out statistically. How deep are you digging into other factors in the workforce, their age, their number of years of experience, their training history, in terms of how often they pop up on the high spikes and dragging them. The more seasoned they are, the less just out of academy aggressive in enforcement, or is that something that mitigates? Um, I think those are all valid questions. I don't know, I don't really have specific answers. I think that in general... Um, so we're not tracking that kind of thing? Well, I mean, it's, it's trackable, certainly. Um, Every barracks knows the time on for the member, whether they're new, how long they've been on, whether they patrol and have a more of a traffic safety orientation to versus a criminal investigation orientation. I, um, I don't know. I think there probably are comments to make about that. I don't know that I could speak anecdotally toward trends. Um, I will say that newer members of our department really embrace and appreciate these types of discussions um, more so perhaps than those of us who have been on for a really long time and um, I, you know I know I just noticed that in general new troopers are like oh yeah I want to, I'm comfortable talking about these types of issues around inclusivity and diversity whereas 
some of us who have been around forever can be a little more resistant to those ideas. So that's a generalization, but. Um, you had referenced the crash data before. Is, is that being used currently as some sort of a, a baseline? And if it is, is there any correlation between what you're seeing in the race data and this report? So I might have Betty chime in about that because analysts use different benchmarking or baseline data. Um, the crash data even itself has been um, challenging because not everyone can agree that people who crash represent people who drive. So, but yes, the traffic, the crash data is um, is being used, um, and I might have Betty expand more on the, yeah. I just have a comment to share. Um, I think it's well known now that Vermont faces a demographic crisis, and I think one of the strategies for working through this is to be able to attract and retain people of color. So what you're doing is really, really important. And um, I heard of a story of an African American who was coming to Vermont, landed at the airport, rented a car, and he's halfway to Montpelier, he had to pull over, he had to take a phone call. And then he saw blue lights approaching him, pulled right up behind him, and he starts to panic. And the officer approached him and said, is there anything I can do to help? He was the director of the national office of the League of Cities and Towns. And he was here to decide if he's gonna have his national conference here. And he did. Wow. because of that exchange. So this is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate sure. that. Do you have any other thoughts for us, or should we see if Betty can? Yeah, I think, would you mind doing that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I just appreciate the time and happy to be here. I have one other question yeah. for you, actually. You're talking a lot about um, the training that, that troopers get when they come into the force and then sort of the ongoing training and the uncomfortable conversations that they might have to have if their data is showing um, showing that there, there might be some bias in their stops. Um, but you said your division is responsible for recruitment and hiring. Mm -hmm. Do you ever try to screen people at the time that they are expressing an interest in becoming uh, a state police trooper to find out whether they come in with yes. biases. Yes. So, and, and I tried to touch upon that earlier that we do view from the very beginning of recruitment and selection, um, that's a critical place where we instill the values of the department. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to attract folks who who are um, certainly unconscious or consciously acting from biases. So um, the way that we do that is through the um, process of, you know, when they're interviewed as part of a, pa uh, a panel of commanders interviews applicants one by one and asks and gives scenarios to see how they would respond just as you know, these are young people who are attracted to policing. We throw scenarios at them and listen to their thought process. Um, and we give them specifically um, examples. Of how would you handle it if you received a call from a citizen, you know, in a town who said, I'd like to make a complaint. There's an African-American man parked in a car on my street. How would you handle that call? And you can learn a lot from people about how they talk about these types of things that we're looking at as a society, racism and um, blatant forms of it, unconscious forms of it, et cetera. So they will then be rated in how they answer scenario type questions. And it's not just those types of scenarios. but um, And then there's an extensive background um, 
process that occurs. So a detective is assigned to this person if they've made it through um, several steps in the hiring phase. And the background is intended to get at um, how they've conducted themselves in their lives thus far. Now, granted, a lot of these folks are like 20-year-olds who live in their parents' basements still, but <laughs> we are... But many of them but, live their lives well, on social media. Yes, exactly. And so we go into their social media and take a look at what they value and what types of, you know, how they portray themselves and so on. So, yes. Thank okay, thank you. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Betty Wheeler, and during the day I work for the Agency of Digital Services in the Department of Public Safety as a Systems Administrator. And my part-time job for the Vermont State Police in the evenings allows me to fulfill my passion of working with data. So what I do for them, <laughs> and everybody usually laughs at that, yes, <laughs> because it's like data. Um, what I do for them is I work with their traffic stop data. And you asked a very good question earlier about what happens with the radio log and how do I look at that. So what I do is I go into their CAD RMS system and I run a report that tells me how many traffic stops that particular trooper had. Then I look at how many demographic entries are recorded for that trooper. And the numbers should be pretty close because the Vermont State Police says they shall issue something at every interaction at a discretionary stop. Sometimes, as you said, they stop a car in error. Maybe the light was reflecting wrong on the inspection sticker and it was a different color than what they thought. So there is no problem. They approach the car, say, I stopped you for your inspection sticker. Oh, I'm sorry. Your inspection sticker is fine. Have a great day. They still have to submit a piece of paper to the admin staff for that stop. It was a discretionary stop. We need that information. So that's what I'm looking for, is that being done. So what happens is the trooper fills out the same information that's on the back of the ticket as to what they perceived the race to be, why they stopped the vehicle, the outcome of the stop, all of that information, and they submit it to the barracks clerk, admin staff, to enter it. And that goes in the system, and that's what I look at to make sure that that is complete. So that's part of what I do. The other thing that I do is I look to see if they're missing something. Did they stop this vehicle and not tell me what the race was? If that's not there, I send it back to the admin staff, to the station commander saying, this is missing. They go back to the trooper, they go back to the paperwork, they see why it's missing. Is it missing because the trooper failed to record it? Is it missing because admin hit one too many tabs and didn't fill in that blank? And if they can correct it, they correct it. If they can't correct it, it's now considered an error in their data. And we look at the percentage of the errors for the overall barracks and the overall state. Um, part of what happened when we initially rolled out the program to collect demographics information is we didn't train. We didn't train the troopers how to collect it. We didn't train the admin staff how to enter it. We didn't look at it. That was our mistake. We should have been looking at it. We should have been auditing it way back when it started, but we didn't. So we were missing things. We were missing the outcome of the stop. We were missing what happened if there was a search. We were missing what was found when there was a search for that whole gap of data that we gave Jack McDevitt to analyze. We trained some people. Well, we didn't train some people. They thought, oh, I should fill this out on every piece of paper I issue. Well, recording what happened on one stop four times because you issued four pieces of paper and only once for another stop really makes a mess of your data. So we had to go back and say, did we do that back then? We sure did. So we left it. We're not going to go back 10 years and correct it. So we drew a line in the sand and said, as of 2016, our data is going to be clean. How are we going to do that? So we came up with a process of every quarter. We dump out all the data, and we look for missing things. We look for duplicates. We look for things that don't make sense, like they put down no search, but then they put down contraband found. Explain that to me. How does that happen? So these go back to admin. They go back to the station commanders that say, explain this to me, fix it. And then halfway through the year, 
I look at it to see if there's a big problem going on somewhere. Is there a glaring number that says, uh-oh, this trooper has had 40 stops. Out of those 40 stops, 25 of them were people of color. Is there an issue? We send it out. Station commander will take a look. Well, guess what? There was a special festival in Rutland. They worked with special detail. Note those numbers make sense. So that's what I do with the data, just to make sure that nothing is going wrong. Um, the other thing that I do with the data is I look at cases within the system. So if someone is stopped and their license is criminally suspended, they are arrested. Did we capture that data? Did we fill out a piece of paper so that we know that this discretionary stop was for a white person moving violation who ended up in arrest? So I make sure that that data is there. What we found um, two years ago is we were missing a lot of that data. If the person was arrested, we weren't capturing that demographic. So now we have a uh, method in place to make sure that we do capture that so that we're not missing that big chunk of data. So we were talking about you know, 1,000 DUI arrests. Did we have that data? So now we go back and look at each one and make sure there's demographic entry for that discretionary stop, if it was discretionary. Now, what if it was a motor vehicle accident? Do we want that information? No, we don't. Um, that's not a discretionary stop. We sent that trooper there to do something. So we've trained our admin staff to look at that. Okay, this is a motor vehicle accident. There's three tickets attached to this motor vehicle accident. But wait a second, the trooper filled out demographics. Let's make sure that's not in there. If they find it's in there, they'll send a note and say, this needs to be removed because this was a motor vehicle accident, non-discretionary. We don't allow just blanket deletes. You need to tell me why something needs to be removed. So just because the trooper failed to collect the information on discretionary stop and is missing two things in that entry and it's an error, sorry, it's an error. We can't delete it. You need to give me a valid reason why something needs to come out of the data. So that's what I do, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Gives us a good benchmark. You asked also earlier what we use for population to figure out if there's a big issue. Um, back initially, the crash data um, did not require that they entered a race of the person. So for 10 years, that data didn't have that. So when Stephanie Seguino did her study and said that's inaccurate information because it's missing so much data, the Agency of Transportation said, well, wait a second, we can modify our program and make this required. So they did that two or three years ago. Their data now gives us a much better picture of what our driving population is based on accidents. They're, we're missing, I think, 30 to 40 percent previously of the race, so it didn't give us a good picture. <laughs> now they're missing maybe 2 percent, maybe 3 percent. So it gives a good picture of the driving population for that area. So now we can say, for example, if we were to go up to the Northeast Kingdom and say, what is the driving population up here? What is the census population up here? You could see a 6% difference between the two. That makes a big difference when you start to look at the number of African Americans that are being stopped, the number of Asians that are being stopped, the number of Native Americans that are being stopped in a particular area. So if we look at the Northeast Kingdom and say we've stopped 3% Asians in the Northeast Kingdom, is this wrong? We may look at the, the census population and say, well, the census population says we have 0.5%, and these are not accurate numbers because I'm not looking at my information in front of me, okay? This is just a what if. But the driving population is 6% Asian. Okay, so we're within a good range of what we should be stopping in this area. If we were to go to Bennington County, Bennington County says maybe there's, census population says there's 2% blacks that live in Bennington County, but we're stopping 6%. We look at the driving population, it says 8%. So that's a big difference between the two. So we're not looking at one, we look at both. And we want to have a good picture there's no accurate way. The only accurate way to do it would be to hire someone to go out and stand at the corner and say black driver, white driver, Asian, and come up with 
driving population that way, but that's not reasonable to do. That's still a perception. Do we stop every car and say we're doing a survey to find out the driving population? That's not accurate either. So we have to use the information we have in front of us, which is the crash data and the census data. So that gives us a good idea. Another thing we like to look at, and we'll take a look at the vehicles people are driving. Older vehicles, newer vehicles. We've looked at color of vehicles, because I just wanted to see, did we stop more red cars than blue cars? We'll look at um, age and sex of the operator. Did we stop more females than males? Because I just wanted to know. Did we stop older people or younger people? Because I just wanted to know. And this is the stuff I'll push out to command staff that says, hey, look at this. Just for the fun of it. <laughs> Can we get that color car? I mean, it might. <laughs> yeah, it might influence. You know what? It really makes it no might, difference. It might influence uh, what kind of car I buy next time. Oh. It really makes a difference because I forget, oh, they still have more red cars. No, they don't. <laughs> it really makes a difference. And then I have to stop and think, well, are there more red cars out there anyway? So then you try to find that information. Good luck. <laughs> We had a nice conversation with you um, previously in, in the larger yes. uh, committee hearing, uh, but there are some <sighs> other questions that we've been swirling around with respect to training. So sure. Yeah, so uh, my name is uh, Cindy Taylor Patch. I'm the director of training for the Vermont Police Academy and the Criminal Justice Training Council, and I've been there since around 2001, um, so I've seen a lot of evolution and culture change. And um, we did speak about our program before, but I'm here today to answer any questions that you have uh, about, you know, more specifics about what we offer. Um, and I, just as a reminder, we oversee both um, basic and in-service trainings, and we serve all law enforcement agencies in the state. So um, I can talk about what we do in basic training, what we do for in-service training. I know the question came up about uh, what's required for fair and impartial policing training. And um, it's not an, an hour requirement, but we do have a subcommittee who reports to the council who um, develops a curriculum for training to be offered every other year per statute. So um, that is the, the number of hours that's required to do that is totally dependent on um, what training objectives the group would recommend um, in the future that, you know, for our next round, what training objectives do we want to meet and then how long is that going to take rather than saying we have, you know, two hours or four hours to fill, but what do we want to accomplish and how long does it take to do that? Um, could be two hours, could be eight hours. So we, we purposefully like to not have it statutorily mandated. It has to be X number of hours because it gives us the flexibility to do whatever we need to do at that point in time. Um, but that's every other year required for every officer and anybody who's um, not compliant with that um, is you know, essentially called to answer for that and it is required for them to maintain their certification as a police officer. So. Um, we do work individually with officers and departments if they are um, deployed in the military, for example, and can't fulfill their training requirement, then we develop a plan for how they're going to get there when they return to law enforcement duty. Same if they're on a medical leave or something of that nature. Um, you know, we'll develop a plan for people to become compliant, but um, if they don't, then it goes forward to the council for consideration uh, regarding their certification. So how do you know if the training is effective? It's a great question. I think um, it's something that we all look at as, you know, what's going on out there in the world. I think the race data collection is a big piece of that. It gives us a nice snapshot in how um, officers are carrying out their responsibility in the community. Yeah. Uh, so I recall seeing in our budget memo um, a request for uh, more appropriation to go from 16 to 20 weeks mm -hmm. for basic training. So yeah. can you give us a sense of what would be included in those extra weeks of training? Yes, and I think there's a few things that I think are of specific interest to this group. Um, one is um, additional training around uh, use of force, and um, I know that you all met my counterpart, uh, Director of Administration Drew Bloom. He and I work very closely together and making sure that you know we're both on the same page as far as um, how use of force training is carried out and then I teach things related to communication and mental health response because that's my background and uh, we work closely together. 
I also work closely with our patrol procedures team, so officers that are teaching patrol techniques like um, how to respond to an alarm and do a building search to how to conduct a traffic stop. And uh, we do a lot of hands-on scenarios in the patrol procedures program, so it's as close we can and get to you know actual live response um, in a designed environment. And we, even those instructors, are very focused on making sure that people communicate appropriately. Like recruits are communicating in a way that's uh, respectful and what we would expect them to be doing when they're out in the world on their own. Um, but. There's uh, use of force time, there's patrol procedures time, so actual live scenarios where um, these folks, and as the major said, some of them very young, um, really, really, really have asked for and benefit from hands-on practice. How do I do this? And have somebody who can be there to guide and mentor them, and this is how you do this. This is how you can um, have respectful encounters with people because um, some of them struggle with communication, and we find that in a generation where um, they're exceptionally driven by technology, uh, that communication is something that needs, needs some guidance and it it's, needs to be done in a live and active environment. So scenarios is a huge part of it. Um, we're also looking to expand fair and impartial policing training. Right now we only are able to give it four hours and we want to give it eight hours. We want to expand from the curriculum that we have that really focuses on implicit bias and we talk about things across the board you know as the major was saying race ethnicity um, socioeconomic status age anything um, sexual orientation transgender issues and um, to expand that to bring people with more lived experience into the classroom you know we don't have, we don't have time for that much right now um, and also to make sure that we're more thoroughly able to cover the state's model policy that was developed um, and things of that nature so um, definitely the four hours there is pretty important to us. Um, some other things, um, right now we have eight hours of interpersonal communication skills and conflict resolution and another eight hours on um, mental health crisis response. But you know we're looking for an additional minimum of eight hours to add more opportunity for de-escalation, uh, substance abuse issues, uh, suicide intervention, and the scenarios that go along with that. So that's um, that's a bulk of what the expansion is looking to accomplish. So, as I look at 464, um, if I'm hearing you correctly, there's a section on there that requires four hours of additional training. Are you supporting that change? And what the, what's the impact on your budget if we add that in there? I think I would have to understand more specifically what the what the goal would be. Again, I would be hesitant to to label it four hours, but just like what what's the goal? What's the purpose of the requirement? And just to remind folks that we already do have the the mandatory fair and impartial policing training re requirement <coughs> already on the books. But I, I think if I read this, um, it it would increase it by another four hours. Basic training is four hours. What the mandate is beyond your basic level is what varies. Okay. So like all new officers have to get the minimum <coughs> four-hour training, right. but then after that, every, every two years after your initial training, you're coming back again for more training for the rest of your career. And the, the number of hours associated with that varies. And if, if we were successful in getting the appropriation to expand basic training, then um, recruits would be getting minimum of eight hours. That's specific. I mean, we also have other places where things come together. Like we have a block of training in our um, domestic and sexual violence training where they talk about human trafficking. There's obviously cultural issues and gender issues within that uh, context. We have a four-hour block of training on hate crimes um, that is taught by folks from the AG's office. So um, it's not just in the, the courses that are labeled that specific topic, but it's kind of interwoven throughout our programming. Sandy, just a real quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, the basic academy is currently 16 weeks, which you want to you want to increase the basic academy to mm -hmm. 20 weeks. Could any of this additional training? Oh, I heard he, and this is dealing with this specific, including this, but other things as well, obviously. Could any of this additional training that you guys want to put into four weeks, could this be done in in what used to be called post 
basic training. I don't know if it's still, you guys still follow that or not. We still do, we, yeah, we have post basic training still. Um, part of the concern around that is um, that anything we do post basic um, would not be required for your certification necessarily, and it wouldn't be testable. Like we spend a whole week. Uh, the final week that recruits are there um, testing their their hands-on live response to different scenarios and um, if we were to do that after graduation and the issuing of their certification uh, it would definitely be a different dynamic a different environment um, we have thought about that um, looking at all factors that it would bring into play uh, but we would definitely prefer to have it within the program so that we can have a more thorough assessment of the whole officer and how they're going to act in the field before certification and graduation occurs. And, and part two of that, getting into could it be post basic, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the officers already on the street, the ones that are already certified working, mm -hmm. need, addition, need additional training mm -hmm. on specifically this bill itself. Mm -hmm. And I applaud that 100%. All right, is there going to be a specific course of instruction, such as a four-hour block, I use the terms that we used to use when I was on the job. Mm -hmm. So a four-hour block on, on Rachel and by, by his training things, that, that an officer, a veteran officer in the street, already working, already gone through basic, already got all the certifications, can he go to that four-hour block and, and get all the additional training and then he just needs to do his in-service every year or two or whatever year. Yeah, so in-service hours are required every year. And for specific to fair and impartial policing, you know, whatever we choose, that, that every other year re requirement, that's in-service. That's what they have to do to maintain their certification. So that's um, a four-hour block? It varies. It varies oh. depending on the year and what training objectives are decided on that it needs oh, okay. need, need to be met. Okay. So they, they, do, they have the opportunity to, to take any in service that we offer, but they're required to take that one. And we also changed our, our rules a couple of years ago that requires um, updated use of force training um, every year. So that's also something that um, officers in the past weren't necessarily refreshing on unless their department um, made a specific priority for that. And we've now required it. You have to revisit use of force training. Um, so. Um, you know, things like that that, that come up, certainly we, we offer uh, mental health training and most people just take it once. I have had some people that will repeat, but um, we're also hoping that eventually if things change at our organization, we have a little bit more flexibility in what we can do funding wise um, to offer more um, opportunities for de-escalation training. Um, right now, you know, we're, we have a tiny staff, we're pretty maxed out. Um, but definitely would like to offer more around de-escalation training for um, officers who are currently in the field. I do partner with uh, the FBI uh, either every year or every other year to bring in their uh, crisis negotiations training. It's a 40-hour mm -hmm. school that they come here um, out primarily out of their Albany office and, and offer to you know, state and local agencies. So we try to partner with them to bring that in as an, another option as well. And that's a 40-hour program? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've heard how challenging it can be for small agencies to access mm -hmm. um, post basic training. And um, have you ever considered a train the trainer model for some of that training so that it can be always done? Basically? Yeah. Yeah, we always do. Um, so, for example, uh, we have had a fair and impartial policing train the trainer before and have officers who have offered that. Um, at UVM, uh, Colchester, um, down in, in our area as well. Um, and when we, probably within the next two, maybe three years, um, we'll be doing another one, another train the trainer for, you know, refreshed curriculum and a batch of instructors. But we tend to do that with most things that we do, especially things that are mandatory training. There's just way too many officers uh, for us to try and train everybody with, with you know, my staff. Right. There's just not enough of us. So we do that all the time across topics. Any other questions for me? Okay. Thank you for being with Thank us. Thank you. That would be an amendment in Section 3 of the bill, because Section 1 is about forming a PAC. Section 2 is about the PAC connected organization name. 
And then section three is really in regard to that issue of limiting who can contribute to candidates and parties. And the operative language right now in the bill is on page six, which currently provides that notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary, only an individual, a PAC, or a party may make a contribution to a candidate or to a party. Um, so an amendment, if um, along with this uh, potential change, would just be to eliminate or to political party there. Um, you would keep this language um, in regard to an ability of an individual to make a contribution to a candidate from their capacity as an unincorporated sole partnership or from their revocable trust that would remain. And the other change would be at the top of page seven here to say that just a candidate shall not accept a contribution from any other person other than those permitted to make a contribution to the candidate, which would be individuals, PACs, and parties. And then you just need a title change, um, a slight title change, um, because you would not address persons authorized to make contributions to parties. Um, so I could do it as an individual amendment, or I could do a strike off. You just would rather have the body see the language in total. Mm -hmm. I think the language in total makes easier. Mm -hmm. And since we're not printing multiple copies like we used to, mm -hmm. a strike ball doesn't cost as much. Jim? I don't know where to start. Um, <laughs> first of all, if we're going it, to, it's, so this amendment, as I understand it, uh, in the original bill that came over from the Senate, um, corporations could not donate to political parties. Correct. They could to PACs. Right. And then they're PACs. And in this amendment, carves out political parties differently. So corporations could donate to political parties. As they currently do under current law. Correct. Yes. I understand that. Yes. So the only thing this does is essentially eliminate um, corporations from donating to individual candidates. So, I, as a candidate, I think I received one modest corporate contribution. Disclosed, visible, the whole world can know about it. Under this law, that corporate contribution could go to a PAC or a party and then come back to me. Is that correct? Or the Indirectly. Or the corporation could form a PAC that could then, that PAC could contribute to you as a candidate. Okay, so for changing the title, why don't we just change it to the Dark Money Act, because we're hiding it. And I know I'm being a little facetious, but we're hiding it. That's not a uh, question for No, me. I know, I know, you just happen to be in the seat. Thanks. <laughs> Hold on, you're in back. <laughs> I'm missing something. We talk about transparency until we don't want to be transparent. So I, I, don't, I don't know what this accomplishes. We, um, I'm going to form a business on the side, you know, form your own pack, because that's how we get around it. Um, I guess it's not for you. <laughs> you're, the, you're, you're the good soldier here. They're writing this up. So So are you are you speaking to the underlying bill as passed the Senate? I guess I'm speaking, speaking to, to my suggestion I, of no, removing I, the parties. I, I'm speaking to the underlying bill. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to mix up. I was feeling bill. afflicted from <laughs> <right now>. I'm <laughs> so glad you clarified. Yeah. Sorry. Any discussion? I have to agree with my colleague to the left here in that I, um, <laughs> I, know, care. <laughs> I know he's not on an island as he normally is here. Um, I, I just don't think that this is going to accomplish what they're, what they're looking to do. 
I think it makes a process that some feel isn't as transparent as they'd like it to be, even less transparent. And somebody who's involved in a few different businesses in different types of corporate um, structures, you know, so now I would have to go through and, and set up a pack if I wanted to, I guess, what, give money to my local committee even. Um, I, I guess I just think that this is a solution in search of a problem. Uh, to your local committee, meaning your State. political party yeah. committee. Um, so you're just under the potential amendment, um, a corporation would still be able to contribute directly to a party with the amendment, the potential amendment that is being discussed, just to confirm. Right, prior to the amendment. Yes. Yeah, I couldn't do it. Right. Correct. Yes, um, so change the limits. No change to the limits. Okay. Um, but right now, let's take a corporation, for example, is a single source. And so a single source is prohibited. Um, it, there's limits on single sources contributing to candidates. Look at the House candidate contribution limits. So a corporation under current law is a single source could give a thousand dollars to a House candidate. Um, a PAC can also give $1,000 to a House candidate. So what this bill would do is not allow a corporation to give a contribution directly to a candidate. The corporation could form a PAC, but then any person that wanted to contribute to that PAC would be subject to the contribution limits on PACs. And then when that PAC gave a contribution to a House candidate, the PAC would be subject to this $1,000 PAC contribution limit. These have been adjusted for inflation. There's an inflation, so I think it's up to $1,040 or something now at this point, something like that. Anarask, Legislative Council. I have behind me the draft 1.1 strike all of H775, which is the act relating to creating the State Youth Council. Uh, you reviewed this language at one of your committee meetings, I think, last week, and you had discussed the changes that you wanted to see um, for this bill. So I have highlighted throughout the language where changes would be made, and so everywhere you see highlighting is a change from the underlying bill. Otherwise, all the language remains the same. So it starts out with um, the findings here. Um, this finding, A1, uh, relates to, I think, a change that you may, you're proposing to make in the makeup of the council. Um, so, in the underlying bill, the council would be made up of youth members between the ages of 9 and 26 years of age, and we'll see this in a later uh, provision, but uh, this committee had discussed changing that to members who are between 11 and 21 years of age, 
And so accordingly, um, this finding in the original bill as introduced uh, provided the percent of the Vermont's population made up of youths 9 to 26 years of, years of age. So since you are no longer focusing on that 9 to 26 year um, age, age range, um, and you're instead going to uh, wanting to discuss the percent of population um, in Vermont made up of people who are between 11 and 21, this um, data point needed to be amended accordingly. I reached out to the chief performance officer to see if we can get, um, if there is data on Vermonters between the ages of 11 and 21 years of age, and uh, that if feedback that I got in response was that we don't have that exact data point, um, but what I was able to be provided with is the age of Vermonters that are under 21 years of age. So note the distinction that it's not counting people including 21 year olds, but those under 21, so zero to 20, that's the best data that I could bring back to you. And that percentage of people who are zero to 20 is specifically 23.74%. Um, so if you wanna just have a more general reference to people under 21 years of age, you can say that they represent approximately 24% of the Vermont population. Um, but just note that it's not capturing also the 21 year olds. So that was that change, any question there? So then you get into the actual substance, substance of who makes up this council. So the bill as introduced would have provided that it was a 15 member council of members between nine and 26 years of age, and that there would be, aside from everyone being appointed from one member from each county, that there would be an additional statewide member who serves as chair. This committee discussed not having an extra person um, because that would mean that another count, one county would get another rep on this council. So it would be one member from each county bringing it down to 14 members and you had requested that the membership be, be between 11 and 21 years of age and similarly that the council itself elects its chair. <coughs> so there are those changes. Um, at the end of line 10, I highlighted that period because that used to say that the, uh, the interagency work group youth services advisory council um, appoints one member who serves as chair. So that's just flagging that that chair language got moved to down here and that the council itself would elect its chair from among its members. Jim. So we, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, but I just want to be clear. Between 11 and 21, so if you were appointed at 21, or 20, you have a two-year term, a three-year term, do you have to get off once you turn 22? So the, the language doesn't state explicitly that you can no longer serve um, after you go beyond 21, but it does say that it's composed of use between 11 and 21, so I would think at least implicitly that if you are surpassed 21 that you should no longer serve on the council. But if you wanted to make it explicit, you could add language to that effect. I don't know if it's necessary. Yeah, but it's, it's not a, a big hang-up. I'm just yeah. pointing out the obvious step. Definitely. And, and, about it might, well. and, it, and it might, from the appointing authority, might say, you know what, we better just be safe and, and by, you know, appoint people 19 or 18. And I'm not sure that, you know, gives you the perspective of the 21-year-old. Mm -hmm. so, whatever. Just to, I just want to support Jim's idea from yesterday. I think, I think we should say between 11 and 21 at the time of their appointment. So you could appoint somebody for three years who was 21 years old, but they couldn't be reappointed at age 24. Mm -hmm. but I think it's, it, it's, it's tough if, if, if they have to step down once they, the moment they turn 22, you wouldn't appoint young people who were 21 because they couldn't serve a full term. Uh, and that, that just doesn't seem right as well. But I thought Jim's idea from yesterday was a good way to go at the time of their appointment. 
the other question that I have now that we're thinking about it is um, 18 to 21 year olds tend to be college age mm -hmm. and if the advisory council was picking from within college age Vermonters or college age students in Vermont um, would anything in this ask them to only consider people whose permanent legal residence is Vermont? It just describes them as Vermont youths between that age range. Um, there's not a definition of what is a Vermont youth. If you turn to election law, it's where your residence is and what you consider to be your home, um, which might still be Vermont even though you're out in some other state. Um, but it doesn't define what it means to be a Vermont youth. age youths who may have grown up as Vermont residents but change their residence when they go off to college so that they can vote in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, and similarly, students from away who move to Vermont and change their residence so they're here and can vote here. Right. I, I would put it at Vermont residents. If, they, if, if they're right to vote in Indiana is more important to them than maintaining their Vermont heritage in, in any unblemished way, uh, so be it. But that should be Vermont residents. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. I totally agree with you. Oh, okay. Should be a Vermont residency is advising so the purpose of advising the governor and things to do with the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I take ownership in that. Mm -hmm. Be a Vermont resident. Mm -hmm. uh, I like that. Any use. Is that uh, Should we say youth residing in Vermont? Or Vermont resident youths mm -hmm. generally. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Did you also want to add the language that, that they're between that age range at the time of appointment? Did I hear a decision on that, or? I think that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got those two changes. Good to go there? Yes. All right. Um, so here on page four is about the requirement of the council to uh, give its advice to both the governor and the general assembly. Um, so here on page four, line eight, I just highlighted that subdivision A because it was just a new subdivision designation. The language regarding um, the government or governor being required to meet with the council does not change, um, but new subdivision B would be added because you wanted to have language that discussed uh, how the council would give its advice to the General Assembly. So this language would say that the council shall annually report its advice and recommendations to the House and Senate Committees on Government Operations and to any other standing committees it deems appropriate and that the report may be in verbal form. Um, so they would not feel obligated to draft a written report, although they might want to. That work for you? All right. So on page five, you get to the part where it discusses how you wanted to make sure it was known that they could participate remotely in committee council meetings, um, but that also you wanted to have some encouragement for council members to meet in person um, because you had stressed the importance of in-person interaction. So this new language um, that I ran by Tucker as our open meeting law attorney 
um, would provide first that members of the council may attend council meetings by electronic or other means without being physically present as a designated meeting location um, as permitted under 1 BSA 312A2. So this is using language verbatim from the open meeting law. That's what that site 2 is and that site 1 BSA 312A2 is a provision of the open meeting law that does allow um, remote participation in meetings so long as there is at least a board member or a staff member of the board present at a designated meeting location so that members of the public can uh, go there at that meeting site. So that's why that language is taken verbatim from the OML and say that they <coughs> may attend meetings by electronic or other means without being physically present as permitted under that provision of the open meeting law re that requires a designated meeting location and someone to be there for members of the public to participate. And then adding there on page five, line five, that a finding um, to reflect your encouragement for in-person interaction. So the finding by the General Assembly that such virtual meeting attendance is particularly expedient for council members from remote areas of the state to participate in meetings, but also the General Assembly encourages council members to be physically present at meeting locations when possible due to the importance of in-person interaction. Um, that language particularly expedient. Expedient is a phrase that the Vermont Supreme Court likes to use when they talk about legislative discretional decision making. Expedient meaning what you find is the right thing to do at the time. Um, so you're finding that it's particularly expedient for these council members who are youths, um, might not have their driver's license yet, um, they might be coming from remote areas of the state and this is fine for them to participate remotely, um, but you're also encouraging them to be physically pre present when possible due to the importance of in-person interaction. Does that reflect what you wanted to state there? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Hi. And then the next change was about their term lengths. So the bill is introduced stated here uh, in, in regard to the initial provisions that the initial appointments will, would be for one, two, and three year appointments and you had uh, suggested that instead that it be their terms be for two and three year um, appointment terms so that they could get a little bit more experience and not just have their time be up after um, a one year, a one year term. And then finally, the last change, or one of the last change, is to uh, state when they had to report back to the General Assembly um, on changes for their ongoing operation. And the bill is introduced provided this reporting date to be November 1, 2021, and you had discussed instead making that uh, recommendation date be January 15, 2022, um, when you'll be in session. And then, good to go on that one. And then finally, you had requested a sunset um, and to give them, um, what, two years from their time of appointment, or no, three years from their uh, time of initial appointment. Um, so this would provide, section four would provide a sunset of the council to be three years after their initial appointment, November 1, 2023. In the meantime, you could revisit on the sunset before that occurs to determine whether to continue the council. All right. As I was thinking about that yesterday, I thought it's a little strange to have it repealed on November 1 when we're, we've been out of session for the great majority of our vacation. <laughs> uh, wouldn't it be better to have it sunset, I don't know, town meeting day? Uh, so that you know, we we could come into a session realizing that we're facing a, a potential repeal, and it would give us time to change it then. Uh, otherwise, we have to do this. Well, certainly no later than mid-May of of 2023. We have to be looking in advance. Jim, Good question for Betsy Ann: Do you folks flag? for us each session, the sunsets that are coming up, um, you know, that year that would have to be acted on, like this session that would expire 
otherwise before we return in January? We can. We have a ledge council attorney who tracks sunsets, so it is possible for us to uh, pass that info on to a committee. I don't know if it's always standard practice that we do, but we are able to. I, I, I just ask, I mean, I, I'm kind of indifferent on it, but if I would hate to appoint the, the new terms in November and then we don't act on a sunset that following session. If the way it is now, if we're flagged, uh, <coughs> help us with our memory, um, we would have acted on the sunset before those appointments set in November for the new three-year terms. That's all. I just, something to consider. I just hate to take the drug out. Oh, you're appointed and two months later, you know, poof, you're gone. Um, thank you for your service. I mean, I think the sunset, you know, unless there's a disastrous result, uh, I mean, I think the sunset's almost automatic. I mean, to be renewed, I would expect. Now's the time if we want to make a change to that. Well, you can agree with me again. <laughs> we have we have the reporting to the House and Senate committees on government operations and to any other relevant committees that they think should get the information. That they would probably do in the early part of any given session. So if a little later in that session they were facing the potential for a sunset, that would be a good time for them to say, by the way, we're doing good work and we'd hate to have the sun set us two months from now. So I, I still think it would be better if the sunset happened while we were in session. Not certainly not in the first week of it. Uh, I, I agree with you. I think that we we need to we and other committees need to be here. To, re to review this for the sunset for the possible uh, sunset action. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't do that in November. It, it, it's unfair to call the committees in to do this in November. So pick a uh, reasonable date, uh, March 1st, March 1st, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Gives a couple months for the, for the uh, legislature. It's been in session almost two months by March 1st. Mm -hmm. Gives them time to look at this. No, I agree with that. But it's kind of, not right. I would just push it back to February 1st. You can push back. I March guess. is a tough time to. Right, you're working crossovers and, yeah. and everything like that too. Like at least, at least you know, give give a, a month or so for the for the for the legislature. Enough time for it to go through. Even, and, enough time for it to go through both the House and the Senate. Yeah, because you're really committing. You're, here you're committing the Senate to things too. You know, you've got to make it reasonable. Yeah. So you um you would like, Madam Chair. A, a walkthrough of what the the House Appropriations Amendment is yes. going to be today. Great. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. So, for the record, this is Representative Diane Lamper, and I'm here today to represent the House Appropriations Amendment that we passed. Um, there might be confusion whether it's, well, it could be confusing. <coughs> House Appropriations passed this amendment because we look at just very specific things within the bill. And we passed this amendment out of our committee, 1100. So we, we all liked our work. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, we've got, when the whole bill came, there's a varying degrees of concern from many, many different places. But the final bill was uh, a 650. So, but I'm just going to speak to our... Do you know where I can find your amendment? On today's calendar and yesterday's today's calendar. If Is it's it up the there. last document on this list? Yeah. No, it's, that was a it's a summary of all the amendments. I think. Yes, we've asked Michelle to update the Eight, summary by topics and including the money committee's amendments as Eight, well as 856. information about the supplemental GovOps amendment and which is under Gannon's name, and the Supplemental Ways and Means Amendment, which is under Sam Young. So we will hear uh, in in that summary, we've Here we got... Are. Sorry. You got it? Yeah, right there. Oops, there we go. Okay. So I have 
just a larger hard copy of it, but okay, I'll I, can, I, will, I can I can can go along with here. But if you um, so there are twelve instances of amendment, and that seems like a lot, and th that is. But they're doing a basically <laughs> a, a few things. So in the first. Uh, instance, which is in section two, we amended the board from five to three members, and that was strictly on a financial r reasoning. And you'll see later that we actually reduced the board, but the dollars seem to have grown because when we got a new yeah. estimate on what it was really going to cost, it was actually higher. Um, so the second instance is in, in section three, which continues to adju adjust the three members to a one member to two year term and a one member to a one year term. And then the third instance, which is section five, the uh, cannabis uh, control board, we do three things is, is accomplished in, in, that, in that section or, or that instance. The first is we removed, you won't see, won't see in that, we removed the language that made the connection between the application and the si and the licensing fee to those established in Massachusetts. So we were looking at the dollars thinking, okay, if it's gonna cost this much to run the board and they have to do fees and they can't raise fees longer, or that you, this put them in a box and put everybody in a box and, and whether or not they were gonna be able to uh, eventually get to the point of being able to um, uh, fend for themselves on, on the fees that were raised. So we just re released them from this Massachusetts connection. But that doesn't say that they won't pay close attention to that all the time. So, so um, we took that part out. The second thing that we did is um, we had the fees fund the duties of the board. And then the third is we recommended the fees repay the general fund um, for the deficit that's allowed to accumulate in section um, 6C over time, over 10, over 10 years if they need to. Um, that is, some of us have sort of a little bit of a trauma issue around when the Vermont Life magazine was allowed to, no, I don't think it was allowed, but because it could draw on receipts, as a lot of funds can, and they're gonna need to. At the beginning, they're gonna have to be able to draw on the receipts to be able to get going. And what we're looking at is to not let that get so far. I don't know if you remember, but um, it's like $3 million in the hole. We could never get ourselves out of, of that. So, so there was some serious backstopping and having the, f the, um, the fees try to pay for the deficit. Um, in the fourth instance of amendment, uh, we continue to move from the three, five to the three board is what that is. And then the fifth instance, you will see that we moved from the $810,000 with updated knowledge from joint fiscal as to what the costs were gonna be uh, is 860,000. <clears throat> so- Joe has a question. Okay. So yes, on that uh, line, if we had kept it five, it would have been a lot more, a million, Any idea? a million plus, I think was the. Okay, so the A10 was wrong. The A10 was probably their best guess at the time, okay. and then JFO so probably being as kind as they money. can. It just doesn't look like it. It point. doesn't. That's okay. why it seems a little illogic, doesn't it? Right. Yeah, but <coughs> it was you. another reason why. Oh my goodness, we should probably sure. keep it at three, for now. And then in the sixth uh, instance of amendment, in 6C, um, the original bill has the A and only the A. So we kept the A as, as the same language, but we added B and C. So 6CB, um, that's kind of a funny sound, um, moves any positive balance that may be at the end of that fund, at the end of the year, or at the end of positive balance um, in the cannabis regulation fund to the general fund, okay? So that it isn't left there as like this little orphan excess dollar hanging on the bottom. So we're, we scrape for every penny you can imagine. <laughs> so, um, so that comes back to the general fund if it's there. And then in section 6CC, 
that we also make sure that if there is a positive balance on the end of that fund, 30% of that fund <coughs> would then go to the prevention as we indicate in 18A. Okay. The seventh instance of amendment is a little more active. Much like you had this discussion that I came in on, which I'm glad of talking about sunsetting, not sunsetting, letting something be, this is fairly new. There's language that the um, auditor in the bill will come back in 2023 after it's been, after the cannabis board is up and running, will come back with their examination and recommendations on, well, that, you know, with, oh, this is how I would interpret it. Time goes on, he's going to take a look at it, and then he'll come to the General Assembly with, this is what's working great, you don't need to do anything, or, okay, we need to make an adjustment here because this is so new, it's going to probably have a lot of variables at first until it settles out. So we sunset the board in 2024, a year after the auditors, which gives us that year, the General Assembly, to come back here and react. Either say, it's fine, we just move the sunset out, or we, we're going to need to work on, on some issues with it. And then the eighth instance of amendment is um, the place where the 6% sales tax. The Ways and Means Committee, unlike the Senate, the Senate had 100% excise tax that goes would go would have gone to the general fund, and our ways and means, you know, which I, I don't disagree with is it's a taxable product. It's like buying this posty, you know. It's it should be, you know, um, a part of uh, the tax revenue. However, this 100% of the sales tax goes to the education fund. Okay, that's good, and nobody disagrees with that. But um, this is where from hearing about the issues and actually in the governor's recommend to actually try to develop a universal after school and i'm sure you've heard where we come to an agreement here in our committee to guide the six percent dollars to the efforts of the grant programs to start and expand after school and summer learnings with a focus on increasing access to um, underserved areas of the state we did not create a fund, and I don't think we needed to. So I get a little uncomfortable just personally having it just fall there, and we're going to have a line item that we track that says this is what the 6% sales tax of the cannabis sales is brought in, and that, you know, AOE, please use them, and then you'll see in, in 17D, uh, you know, in the manner to which we the legislation intends you to do. And um, even in 17D, we don't just leave them alone to make that decision. We actually ask for, uh, in mid-November and each year after, to report back or submit to the General Assembly a plan to fund grants uh, in, in the way that was laid out in 17C. So that's the, the, the grant process. There currently is a grant process at AOE for the uh, 21st century. I keep saying century 21, so I apologize. <laughs> because I have to think about it. For, it's 21st century. It's not, not the real term. <laughs> Those are federal grants that come in and flow through AOE out to communities that apply. It's a competitive grant piece. So it would be in my thinking that the, the funds that would flow, that we would provide a number that says this is the 6% sales tax that would boost that grant program. Um, and if you had heard, you probably have heard that um, in order to get to that goal of universal after school, in 2015, it could have been 14, but 2015, there was a, a report that it would take approximately $2.5 million to get there. So not, not to put words in the governor's uh, mouth, but I was so excited because I've been a part of many of these conversations to see that he was so focused on it in the state of the state and in his budget address and actually referenced cannabis. Get my fingers crossed. All right, so that's what that does. There's an amendment 
uh, in the calendar, the Beck and Browning Amendment, that is proposing to strike this out and just let those dollars fall to the Ed Fund with no, no guidelines. Um, our committee voted on that amendment to find it unfavorable 11-0. So, um, so we'll have that discussion on the floor. The ninth instance of amendment, um, oh, does for the prevention fund. This, this is a similar setup as what we did for education, but takes the 30%, I'll just pull it, takes the 30% of the revenue and, and um, uh, has the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council recommend the prevention programming that that 30% should go to. And then the 10th, 11th, and 12th are just the, um, it's never just, but it's the alignment of the effective dates to our amendment. So in a nutshell, of, and I'll probably say this on the floor, but there are so many needs in our state. There are so many holes for resources that are needed just everywhere you look. Um, so for us to vote 11-0 to use this money in this way is a significant say that where we find the priorities because of the nexus with cannabis to and in our prevention programs and our desire to wrap this money around our kids and to keep them safe in so many ways and we have already avenues we don't need to reinvent the wheel we don't have to do this from scratch scratch there are programs and entities and avenues just needs the resources so that's why we chose those directions madam chair and everybody i'll be quiet if you want to so that yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Committee, do you have questions? Rob and then I'm, uh, Good morning, Diane. Good morning. I'm still trying to understand the connection between the initial cost going up 50000 and we're dropping back two cannabis board members. Where, where is the additional costs coming from? An update from JFO. Stephanie commented. Right. To tell us that when they looked at it again, this is what they feel is the true cost now. I can ask her for a little more explanation as to where and why that came up. Yeah. But that was, you know, she just wanted to update us that this is so no they longer. they didn't give you any specifics. They just, when they, as far as what their estimates were, they didn't really drill down as to, I mean, I, I don't know why would it be 50,000 more with two less people. That to me is quite a significant shift. Yeah, it wrong. Well, apparently it's wrong. Well, apparently wrong. Representative Young has an answer. No, Michelle to that. Oh, good. Oh, Michelle has an answer. So, uh, and uh, I don't blame you for not remembering this because it was last year that you dealt with it. But when y'all were working on this piece and you decided to increase the number, because this came over from the Senate with three members mm -hmm. and the 810, is you guys increased it back to five, which is what the community jurisdiction in the Senate had originally before Senate approach reduced it to three. But, uh, but you didn't, even though you increased it from three to five, mm -hmm. you didn't tweak the 810, you left that. If you had made it go to five, it would have had, it would have been more than 810, but you left that 810 number knowing that appropriations was gonna oh, yeah. do their part. So the 810 was reflective of three. And so it's really only an increase of 50,000 for a three-member board, and uh, and part of that seventy said was it's a it's another year out, and and then they also just kind of looked at it and tweaked it a little bit. But the eight ten was always for three members. Okay, thank See, you. That helps. There's another little piece because I have a tendency to get way down in the no pun on this, but the um. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm sorry. It will be said a few times today. We've heard yeah, so many yeah. times that we don't even chuckle anymore. <laughs> that this is only 10 months. This number is only because it's, a, it's only a 10 months, so it's not the true annual cost. So the year after that, it will be a full 12, just so that when we take a look at it, we know, don't, to us, don't freak out when we see that this is like a million in the next year. So you're saying that the 860 is, is a 10, 10 months. month number, mm -hmm. and the next number will be even higher? Could be. It would be anticipated to be. 
Chairman? So, oh, sorry, Mike. the sunset on the board. So, if we don't extend the sunset, the board goes poof. They're gone, right? Right. So, if some of us wanted to, at that point in time, have that conversation, whether it's up and running, we've done all the regulations, et cetera, um, and want to put it, for example, under DLC, um, we could have that conversation then. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Quick you can have a lot of conversations with them. Yeah. Or, uh, okay. Mike, quick question on your way out. Um, yeah, just thank you. This is good work and a really tough bill. Um, I'm wondering, you're going to get I questions was... about the money going to after oh, school. I wonder if we, we do better to reflect the reality that this is extended day summer learning. Yes. It's not after school, so kids can have swings to go on. Uh, these, this is an extension of the school day. It's, it's structured learning that happens in the after school hours and in the summer to prevent summer learning loss. So those yeah. questions will come up, and I'll certainly yes. speak to it, but hopefully yeah. we can. Because after school people don't know. means YMCA, Boys and Girls it Club, does. your teen center. So I have that and in my notes. And C, too, the state is, is a part of that, yeah. exactly. So we. It should be, you know, we've heard it's called after school, you hear it called third space, yep. and trying to get the language correct to the actual activity. Questions? Come in, Bob. And just to really be ironclad, sure, the 30% that's going to prevention of education is effectively a business expense. There's no way that that gets not contributed from It'll day, be, day one. I, I, would have liked, just me personally, would have liked to see it a little a harder, harder placement, you know, um, only to keep, um, I would like it to have gone into a fund, but I do understand the dynamics around that because right now it, it would be a line item in our forecast that says this is the cannabis forecast and a, a number that would be agreed upon, like the dollars when we, I call it balancing the checkbook. In January and June, there'll be a forecast number of what the dollars are going to come in from cannabis. And then we know that 30% of that goes to prevention for this uh, substance misuse and advisory council to say, here's what we want to use those dollars for in the prevention programming. But there's, there's no avenue by which somebody gets to say, oh, we're going to start to pay back the general fund a little bit more we, first have that authority as legislators and may not be here in four years so somebody can always but do that notwithstanding notwithstanding mm -hmm. and so it's going to take vigilance which is where like this weekend i can honestly say that we you know we're trying in our committee we've got the budget and we had a couple other bills there was the global solutions and there's act 250 and so we kind of broke this bill up into some sections that that, is, that we worked on pieces of it and plus the whole so I can say Friday we it was it was all weekend and Monday Monday was <laughs> of wrestling to get to a place that we could that we were very that we could go 11-0 nobody in our room likes everything even within our own amendment um, but we can we got to a place where we could all support it uh, representative young for the record Ways and Means Committee. Um, and I also point out that uh, there's a fiscal note that got emailed to everybody. Um, late, late, latest updated fiscal note should be in your email, and there will be some paper copies as well. Um, first, the Ways and Means Amendment is the, 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 the basic gist of it is uh, the, the Senate had a 16% excise tax and a 1% local option tax. The basic gist of the Ways and Means Amendment is that it would be a 14% cannabis excise tax and apply the uh, sales tax, um, and that would also allow for a 1% um, local option sales tax. Um, the other thing that we did um, was to remove the $6 million cap on the, pro the Substance Abuse Prevention Fund. And if you look at the fiscal note, um, it doesn't look like it really gets close to the $6 million cap, but in case there was a, if more money came in, uh, more tax revenue came in, and it hit the $6 million mark, it would just continue to fill up the prevention fund. Um, I think, I think that's pretty much the Ways and Means Amendment. 
Rob, question. So I have a 1% local options tax. That only applies to the, the communities that currently have it. That's correct. Let's say that a, a community is, goes through and has an affirmative vote and gets one in the future. Would they be able to apply the 1% local options tax? Yes. They would. Yeah. And currently about 40% of the sales in the state actually follow, have, a, have a one, the 1% 1 local option tax on it. Um, but we, I don't know, since my time on Ways and Means, we've probably approved five more towns that have the, the local option tax. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's by charter. It kind of depends on whether it's like around Act 60, whether you had to do it by charter or not. But if it's a charter, we generally approve the charter change. And actually, it goes through this committee, too. But aside from that, there really wouldn't be any revenue sharing from a tax perspective. Uh, that is correct. And which kind of rolls into the next amendment, which is a, a recommendation from the uh, cannabis Control Board for next year when they recommend this fees for the state, also to recommend fees for the for local municipalities. And if it was just a local option tax, only towns with uh, retail establishments would get any revenue. And this would allow for uh, if you had the other types of entities in your town that you would actually be able to get some money for the municipality for the different types of licensees and not just the retail licensees. So it kind of spreads it out a little bit more. So based on what I've heard today, then if, if I am somebody that's applying for a license, I'm going to have at least two license fees that I'm going to have to contend with. I'm going to have the state one, and then potentially I have to have the local one as well. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So where where does the municipality get the money? The state or the local or both? I say get the money. I'm talking a portion of the license fee. Unless I'm wrong here. This, the, this portion, I'm looking for a portion of the state license fee or whatever they're doing. And if the local, if the municipality forms a Cannabis Control Board, and they set local license fees. Does, yeah. So, does this bill allow the town to collect the fees from both licenses, or does the town have to go through a charter? No. To do no. 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 The local um, one? The, 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 for the fees, there doesn't need to be any sort of charter change. Um, but it's just like just like we had in, that was in the bill before for the Cannabis Control Board to come back with uh, recommendations for the fees for the state licenses. They'll also come back with a recommendation for local fees. And we will have to. And we will have to approve, approve whatever that is them. next year. Raise them lower than whatnot. Question. I was just going. I was just going to clarify um, for for JP is that I think what you were talking about is the when the local so if you have your select board do create a local cannabis control commission they'll still do their local permit fees and can do that and then this new local fee that's assessed at the state level is separate and then that'll go back to the towns right and my 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 question or issue was could the local select board when they establish a cannabis control board commission whatever you want to call it I don't care um, and they uh, decide to establish a local license fee. Can that be done here without having to come back to the state? In other words, I know you're going to come back with the state fees, and uh, the legislature will look at it again. But at least I think that's what's going to happen. Right, but, the, but there's there's two so two separate things. Two separate, two separate local fees. There's the one that if because not all towns will establish a commission and issue their local permits, but if they do, they can collect those fees on their own, okay. just like it came out of here. They don't need anybody's permission separate or apart from that. want to make sure. Yep. And I'm sorry, but I'm still a little confused about that then. So the Cannabis Control Board will set fees at the state level, 
correct or recommend fees? The, the, the recommend level? fees to us, we have to approve fees. But the fees at the local level, the municipal level, will they also be making recommendations or the local governing bodies that would have oversight over the cannabis community? Can they set their own fees or does that need some other approval? That hasn't changed from the way that you guys had it in your local in your in your uh, local government piece around issuing if you decide to, to issue local licenses. Mm -hmm. You guys hadn't it was just there wasn't anything that really addressed the issue of how to set those fees or what they're supposed to be. Well, but initially we were only talking about retail establishments as well. Now that's been brought into any license, correct? So I'm still trying to find out. So who is who's going to have the final say as to what a fee can be at the local level? Is it going to be the, the local governing body or is it going to be the, the state level cannabis control uh, cannabis board? Well, ultimately setting the fees has to happen right in the ways it needs to with a recommendation from a policy committee, with a recommendation from the board. Right. Jim? I mean, isn't this similar to what we do with liquor licenses? We set a liquor license, $400, $100 of that, which you do here, goes to the municipality. Portion goes to the municipality. Isn't that what we're talking I mean, about? I, I, or are we talking that about is, a totally separate license? That is. It's essentially what we're talking that about, but that uh, I wouldn't say that, that anything that. has been set in stone. We're just, we're just asking for a recommendation. <coughs> and yeah, I'm sure there's going to be a lot, a lot of public info, input from the municipalities in that process. I'm sure. So the confusion level went from here to here now. Back so the initial question, does the town, municipality, whatever you want to call it, have the authority? Or the town does have the authority to establish a local cannabis control board, commission, whatever name you want to give it. And then, does the town have the authority to set the dollar amount for the fees without any necessary approval from the state of Vermont, period. I'm anybody in the state of Vermont, legislature, cannabis pro board, anybody, a governor, I don't care. Can this town set it without any authority being required from the state of Vermont? I think the answer is yes, but I'm gonna look to the lawyers. So, so section 863, which is the regulation by local government that y'all work so, so much on, that is not amended at all by the Ways and Means Amendment or by the separate uh, Young Amendment. The only thing, uh, so whatever you had with regard to your inherent authority to issue the local licenses, there's nothing in that language about how you set fees or anything like that. There's nothing restricted, it's not addressed. So I think the, the presumption was that it would, be, it would be following the way that you do with liquor licenses now. So there's no requirement that you get anybody's approval for, for fees or anything like that. There's nothing in there that says specifically an affirmative, you can set fees for those permits. I presume it's, in, I mean, I would consider it to be implied because you, that's what you do is you issue a permit and you collect a fee for it. Right. That's completely separate. That's not touched by any of these other amendments. The only thing that the Ways and Means and the subsequent Ways and Means amendments are dealing with are this new additional fee that would be, uh, that would, the board would recommend to you, legislature would choose what it is and say, Board, you're now when you when people get licenses, they're going to collect a state fee and a local fee, and they're going to figure out what those are, and then that's going to go out to towns, regardless of whether whatever type of uh, cannabis establishment they have there. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. I, so I, some I towns may choose. So every so under this proposal, the idea is that that all towns will get probably some money from the state collected local fee, and then only the towns that choose to issue a local lice permit 
through their local select board, I, you know, slash cannabis control commission, um, will be doing that individual permit fee. Right. Based on fees that are recommended and approved by. No, 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 no. It's completely mm -hmm. local. Yeah, it okay. doesn't. Yeah, the the the, the recommendations. And I'll double check, but the recommendations are just having to do with the new local fee. But I'll double check to make sure that you couldn't read it otherwise. <laughs> huh? Um, yeah. um, Other questions, Katie? Sam, is there anything else? I think that's it. Great. So, committee, we, we should, John, is there anything that you want to add to this? No. Okay. I think Sam did a great job. So, we have a Ways and Means Committee amendment that will come up very first after the initial floor report. Um, and then we'll do the Appropriations Committee um, amendment on the floor. And then we'll come back to the other amendments, in one of which being. Uh, Sam's second amendment, which is this local uh, local fee issue. So I'd like to do a show of hands on the Ways and Means Committee amendment. So that looks like... <laughs> All right. If you are a yes on the Ways and Means Committee amendment, let's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven... And if you are a no on the Ways and Means, Ways and Means Committee Amendment, three, seven, three, one. And Sam Young's second amendment with the local uh, municipal fee. Show of hands if you are in favor of a municipal. Uh, Do we want to bring it up? Well, can we, can we search it? Hold on. Let's search it. Oh, that's it's yeah, that, 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 uh, yeah, that's a state fee. But young. Oh yeah, that's good. Let's look, let's look up. Let's look me up. So there's young for ways and means, and then there's young for. There we go. And really the. Are we ready to vote on second amendment? JP? I'm reading, I'm reading this, and this is why I brought the question up. The question I had was the towns and municipalities have total control over setting the local fees. In this amendment, states that the Cannabis Control Board, which is a state board, remember I said anything from the state of Vermont, all the way from the governor down to, to a committee. And the answer was presumed that the town could set the fee as they saw fit. So I accepted that. This amendment states that the Cannabis Control Board is going to recommend for the local fees. The board must recommend design to create a cost. We all know why and everything like that. Um, and then it creates the authority for the board to charge and collect the local fees. Why it is was the state going to collect a local fee, a local license fee, if the town's going to have total control over it. So you don't get that. It's the new fee that's added by uh, the Young Amendment. I think, I understand, I understand how you're reading that. And I think if it, if it helps, you know, I can do an amendment that anybody can offer uh, out on the floor today that will just clarify and I would amend 863 on the regulation by local governments is, you know, affirmatively state that the commissioners 
may you know determine a fee that they may, may then you know charge for the, the the local control license that is under 863 which is separate and apart from the state assessed local fee so I'm happy to do some clarifying language if that would help folks Marcia? so let me see if I understand this there will be a state fee there are, actually there are just two fees involved in this one at the uh, local level and one at the state level but the uh, new board will recommend the rate for both and if I'm a municipality and I have a grower I'm going to collect that local fee for the grower's license for the municipality regardless it's going to be coming to the town and then the state fee goes to the state so they're just two not three uh no okay and i don't know maybe text abby um so uh and i'm doing my best here but i didn't write this amendment actually so uh so what you guys have worked on with the like just like liquor mm -hmm. you can establish the local control license and you can set a fee for that that the intention of all this that is untouched that exists and then the new part is that the board is going to recommend you know fees <coughs> all the multiple fees as part of that a new in addition local fee that would be collected on you know at the state level for all applicants um, so so uh, that would then and then figure out right make recommendations about how that's distributed to to all the municipalities and they would be recommending to the General Assembly who remember it's always the General Assembly that sets the fees not the board mm -hmm. about what that would be but so the idea is that there is a potential of two what you would consider to be local fees okay. one which is you know assessed at the board level to every licensee and then the other one being an option for towns that they don't have to do it maybe they don't want to do a local you know a cannabis control commission um, or maybe they do and they're saying well we're only going to issue local control licenses to retailers and integrated licensees but we if it's cultivators we're not going to do that or whatever so they get to do they still get to have that authority that you created in here with regard to the local government and that's separate and apart and they can set that fee right but I understand why folks are getting a little confused about that because there are ostensibly you know potentially two local fees one at the state level that's collected and then one at the potentially at the local level if they issue the local control license and so I think that you know we can add just some little clarifying language in 863 um, and on the other one and we can do it as a separate amendment just to make it clear to people that that if this by, by adopting the young amendment and having the new state assessed local fee does not negate any powers that this that the town is able to have under 863 and I'll bring this feedback back to my committee as well so we'll discuss it just so I can get my, my brain wrapped around this. So basically what we're talking is that if you have a local legislative body that's got oversight over cannabis, mm -hmm. they will set all the fees. But if you're in a community that doesn't have one, that this gives the state the right and the authorization to... No. No, this would be the, the new proposal with the local fee collected by the state is going to be something for everybody. Everybody wins on, under that in terms of the towns. Whether you and, and they'll figure out just to make a proposal with regard to distribution things like that. So, they, so if you look at the, the language in the amendment, it talks about that it's you know to to deal with any impacts of the regulatory scheme. My, uh, I, I, so let's read the language in the in the young amendment so the recommendation 
So this is shall be accompanied by information justifying the recommended rate as required by 32 VSA section 605D. The board shall recommend local fees that are designed to help defray the costs incurred by municipalities in which cannabis facilities are located. Right. So but, it's not every municipality. Well, it's I where mean, they're located. But it's state, but it's state board. That's the state board. Right. Yeah. But but it's for every type of licensee. Yes. So if, if at the local level you decide that you're only going to issue local control licenses to retailers or whatever, then that's your prerogative to do that and collect Correct. a separate fee. Without a, camp, a local cannabis control board? You can, no. You, you would can, have to do it. You'd have to you'd create have to a local, local cannabis, cannabis board, board. <coughs> to, to issue permits. To issue the permits. local license. Just like local liquor. Yeah. But the, the problem with the liquor analogy is it sounded like the $400 is set here. Mm -hmm. So where, it isn't $100. Where with the local board, it sounds like and that that's being set in Milton with their local cannabis control board. Not irregardless of what the state sets as its master fee for everybody. Once City Council in Milton decides they're going to allow a sales establishment there, they set the fee for that permit. Is that correct? Jim? Can we ask Abby if she works on the tax and fee mm -hmm. stuff? I don't mean to put you on the spot, sure, but. <laughs> can, here, can I give you the seat? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I have five minutes more. Run, <laughs> I'm no. supposed to be in committee, but that... they haven't taken up. I was just there. Okay, they're yeah. about to. <laughs> just so you know. Um, okay, thank you for inviting me in. So, Abby Shepard, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, I did work on this draft, so I think I can answer part of that question. Um, this is just for the report that the board would make about what the local fee should be set at, but then it would still be up to the state to set those local fees, and they would follow the fee bill process. So this language is sort of an opening so that local fees can be proposed. It does not establish any. It does not set the rates or the amounts. Um, and again, it's still required to follow um, six, it's 32 VSA 605, which requires uh, fees to be for the cost of providing the service or the cost of administration. So just to be clear, if my friend in Milton wants to establish a higher fee, he can't. It would depend on what the, the board proposes and the legislature okay. then allows. Then if right. that board thought that the fee should be higher, they would have to come to the legislature and propose a higher fee, and the legislature would have to enact it. Thank you. That's clear. Oh, so you just said, so now we're back to the opposite from what I was told earlier. Now, now the local, local, local commission, whatever, is going to have, have legislative approval to set that fee. So, scenario. State of Vermont sets a license fee for whatever they're going to set, whatever thing you're going to do, cultivate and retail, whatever. Make something up. 5000 bucks. And then, and then, and then the state's going to set a, a fee that the local people will get us probably get, 2000 bucks. Now you're up to $7,000, okay? So now the local municipality commission wants to set a fee, and they want to say 5000 bucks. In order for them to set that fee of $5,000 for the local, the third or the second actually local tax, that five thousand dollars has to be approved by the legislature. And, and, and for simplicity, that's a yes or no answer. Yes. Okay. And that would apply to every local fee. It wouldn't okay. be just for if that particular municipality said we think that it should be a higher amount. It would change it for all localities, assuming that that's the structure that we follow. This is also a recommendation. Okay. So why yes, should the, the city of Burlington and have the right or or Actually, why shouldn't the city of Burlington have the right to set a $10,000 local fee where a, a town municipality or whatever name, pick mine, sets a local fee of 5000 Why does it have to be five or ten for the, every municipality? You see what I'm getting at? I'm talking about the, the third tax, which is the second local tax. You see what I'm getting at? I don't think this language gets to that amount of specificity. I think that would be part of the proposal of what the board would recommend to the legislature. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm afraid I can't answer. This sounds to me like the board recommend, is going to recommend, and may recommend, and whatever happens, happens, and uh, yeah, you, might get, you might get one. And the sorry. final say would be yeah. by the legislature. Right. Okay. Jim? Um, I would move that we find uh, Representative Young's amendment favorable. More discussion? Show of hands if you approve of Representative Young's amendment. And if you disapprove. Thank you. Thank you, sir. of amendment here. Um, most of these are very technical corrections. Um, so in the first instance of amendment, what we're doing is changing the number of names that the governor has to submit to the Cannabis Control Board Nominating Committee from 10 to 5, um, which just seems like a, a more reasonable number of names to submit for each vacancy. So when the Cannabis Control Board is first set up, he'll have to submit at least 15 names. Um, any vacancies after that, it would be five names. Um, the second one really just eliminates a, a redundancy. So, you know, it, it said groundwater, you know, quality requirements or regulations. So it's now just groundwater quality requirements. And so that's just removing a redundancy um, that was in the bill. Um, the third um, instance of amendment. Um, is changing the definition of small cultivator um, by increasing the square footage that a small cultivator can grow cannabis in from 500 square feet to 1,000. Um, the reason we did this is we heard from small growers and they are more comfortable and think it's more economically viable um, to have 1,000 1, square feet than 500 square feet. Um, the fourth <coughs> The fourth um, instance of amendment is very similar to the second one. Um, it, it, it just eliminates redundancy. Um, then um, E replaces, um, oops, oh no, the fourth instance, so, sorry, just changes language with respect to um, pesticides and ensures that federal regulation of pesticide applies to cannabis cultivators. Um, the fifth amendment is a language change that we intended to have in our amendment to the bill but failed to make it in. Um, this was a recommendation from the Committee on Health Care is that all advertisements shall contain health warnings developed by the Department of Health and adopted by rule by the board. That is the language that we agreed to. Um, uh, John, is uh, the fourth instance number E40 CRF the most stringent? Regulation. There's no state that would. Well, we'll get to another. There's. A, I'll get to another thing that deals with pesticides. But this is just ensuring that federal pesticide regulation applies to cannabis cultivation. Um, so then we move on to the sixth amendment, which gets sort of your answer there. Is this make sure um, that any rules adopted by the cannabis control board around pesticides need to be at least as stringent? as those developed by the Agency of Agricultural Food and Markets. So they can't make something less stringent. They can only make it more stringent. Um, the seventh instance amendment is another thing from healthcare. Just again, um, making it clear that the labeling requirements for cannabis sold by re to re retailers and integrated licensees includes health warnings developed by the Department of Health. Um, the eighth instance of amendment changes the number of milligrams of THC in basically edible products from 100 milligrams to 50 milligrams. 
Now the serving size hasn't changed here, so the serving size is still five milligrams, but the, the purpose of this change is um, to make it, to reduce the risk of somebody consuming too much cannabis um, in an edible product. And I will say this is the most stringent standard of every of any state in the country. Most states um, set the the total um, milligrams of THC at 100 and the serving size at 10. Um, so we are under both. Um, the ninth instance amendment is again this is coming from healthcare um, and deals with labeling and appropriate warnings developed by the Department of Health. Again, the Department of Health has to, to develop the warnings <laughs> and then the board has to <coughs> implement those. Um, the tenth instance amendment um, says that well there can be um, exceptions or accommodations for small cultivators. Um, there cannot be exceptions or accommodations with respect to land use and environmental um, things, which is what Section 869 of our bill covers. Um, the 11th instance of the amendment um, we just learned about yesterday is that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration um, is getting out of the business of approving roadside devices um, or setting impairment levels. And so with this change, it really makes it, the, what will happen is the Department of Public Safety will make a recommendation to the General Assembly as to what, you know, is there a measurable level of impairment for cannabis? And two, is there a testing device, a roadside testing device that can accurately determine that level of impairment? And so they will be making a recommendation on those two things to the General Assembly, and then the General, General Assembly can determine um, whether to approve the use of that device for roadside testing. And that's it. Jim. Do we need to take action on this? Mm -hmm. I would move that we find Representative Gannon's amendment favorable before we lose any more people. <laughs> 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 Questions for John. Uh, most of these are, uh, are issues that we're kind of bringing this into alignment. The, the NHTSA um, amendment is the one that popped up yesterday, um, but I think we still have uh, a solid expectation that DPS will come to us if and when there's a, uh, a device that is uh, accurate and can do a timely test. So, uh, all those in favor of the Gannon Amendment, all right, let's leave it open for those three. What was that? I do. That, that was unanimous so far, but we're missing three people, so Sorry. eight. Eight. Hey, quit while you're ahead. <laughs> <laughs> He's feeling so, very feisty today, so. I hate to beat this, this licensing <coughs> thing to death, but what happens if municipalities decide that they will set their own local fees so high as to prohibit any kind of uh, growing, manufacturing, processing? Up to them, Jim. I, I think it, it, it would be if we allowed it next year. You know, the board comes back with a recommendation, right. and if we decide collectively that we want to give that authority, so right now I think it's a moot point because we don't know what they're going to propose, and we don't know how we're going to feel about it. Um, if, if we want to allow Burlington to, you know, set a $100,000 license fee, um, when I doubt we would do that, but I mean, that would be up to us to give them that authority, I think, as I understand it. My friend from Ways and Means left, but. Um, or, or range? I mean, we could do that. It would be unusual. Um, just like it is with liquor license, it's the same in every single community. Mm -hmm. And that share is the same in every single community today. Yeah, you know, y'all know my intentions behind all this. Yeah, was to represent the, the people that I've been, that yeah. I'm here for. And that's the residents of the town of Milton. Yeah, 
<clears throat> so should Tom Milton decide they want to allow uh, cultivation of cannabis for retail purposes and or allow a retail store to sell the cultivated cannabis. Uh, they have the right to do that by, by town vote initially and by saying town commission, but I, 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 I do understand that the state wants to have control over how much the municipality can charge somebody to do this. And that bothers me greatly. It bothers me greatly that the state is going to be able to mandate to the municipality you can charge this amount, but you can't charge what you decide you want to charge. But that's always been the bill even before this Ways and Means change. I, I mean, there was a 2% local option tax I, I, that was set by the legislature. I, I know, I understand that. And, but with, at least with the 2% local options tax, the, the municipality on retail sales, anyway, I know it was the retail sales, was going to get the 2%. So that was something that the municipality was going to get. Right now, the municipality is going to be able to state the size they're going to well, get. They're going to give them, whether it's $500 or, or $50,000. From a from a two percent options tax, and there's a big difference. Big difference. Yeah. Option tax was based on sales. This is sales based on permits. licenses. Yes. So, so for example, in Milton, I, I, I understand. So that. let's let's use the example of Milton, which has a dispensary. So if the the dispensary, you know, can get an integrated license, so there would be a potential fee set by the state. For, for that license. And the town will get a portion of it. Yeah, no, the town will, there's a local part that they will get all of. Right. And there might be other growers or other manufacturers who seek to be licensed in your municipality, which could offer more license fee revenue than, um, than in the scenario where it was a percentage of sales. Um, I, from the perspective of my small community where I don't know whether anybody will um, choose to open a retail shop, I actually think that this uh, is uh, an, a more even spread of uh, revenue sharing across the landscape because you can imagine that there you know, are, is going to be a wider distribution of growers and labs and wholesalers and manufacturers across the landscape than there will be for the distribution of retailers. So, you know, from, from the perspective of my community, I could see having more, uh, more of an even revenue spread across the state. I have a question, but the other side of that thing is the thing that I've always been concerned about this, that inducement that have the sales. Mm -hmm. That's the horse that's out of the barn. Okay. Well, this is, this is the next stop of the bill on the floor for the House to adopt it. After that, we will have to sit down in conference with the Senate, who has a different scenario of mm -hmm. taxation than we do. So that will be an interesting conversation. Yeah. I anticipate that you know if this bill is supported on the floor this afternoon. And we will have a conference committee, and I think one of the things that will be hotly debated in that conference committee is local taxation. Mm -hmm. um, given that you know, I've heard that from the Senate. I, I mean, I think that is one of their concerns. So I mean, with this bill as it comes out of the House. So you know. There's still another step in this process, assuming this gets passed on the floor this afternoon, um, where we'll, we will have a say because we'll be part of that conference committee process. We who vote for the no. Yeah. Okay. We who vote for it. JP? <clears throat> uh, another problem I have, and I understand, I, I know why the, the fees haven't been set. Anyway, the problem is that I see is we have no idea what these fees are going to be. And we won't until the, the Cannabis Control Board sets these fees. So these fees could be thousands of dollars, or these fees could be hundreds of dollars. We don't know. Yes? We're setting the fees. They're making a recommendation. True. True. Okay. And that's fine. 
I'll stand corrected on half of that. But we, we set the fees, but based on their recommendation, but but to date, I do not know what these fees could that's, be. That's fair. So this could be a fifty thousand dollar integrated license fee, or it could be a five hundred dollar integrated license right. fee, and that's a big difference. Yeah. Well, let's look at what did again. I'm trying to represent the the sure. the, the, the cause my constituents in my town because we have the largest medical right now it's medical marijuana dispensary in the state and who knows that could expand well a dispensary's fee licensing fee today is twenty five thousand dollars that's the recommended which is no that's what it's a state fee that's what Shane pays yep yeah but that's, that's, but that's, not, that's, but that's medical i'm mean, talking retail yeah, well, what do you get now? Right? <laughs> and there's no taxes, so there's no ability to collect a option tax on dispensary sales. On this, so what you're, what you're saying is, is I think you're saying, John, is you're again, we don't like to use what are assume, but we, we need to assume here because we don't have set things. So we're going to assume that the let's let's say an integrated fee. Which is the biggest and the best and the largest fee, which is going right. to get the most money, is going to be at least how much? I think you know you could model it after the integrated life. I mean, not the dispensary fee Actually, that is currently charged, which is twenty-five. I think is that it? Right. Right. And that and that twenty-five, will, all that twenty-five will go to the, all that will go to where? It will go into the cannabis regulation fund to support the cost of the cannabis control board. So what, what part is going to, what, what, what the amount do you think is going to go to the town? Well, so we'll there's a again. separate fee that will be set for the town. Again, we don't know. We don't know, but we don't know any of these fees. I, I know but that's, ultimately, that's we here, yeah, we decide. Yeah, it's going to be yeah. something. Yeah. And you'll have input into that process. Yeah. We continue. All right, the only other amendment that I know of was an amendment to the appropriations section of the um, was an amendment to the appropriations amendment which essentially um, takes out you want to describe that to us percent sales tax use going to the grant program okay it so it, it does not it does not designate where the six percent sales tax revenue goes it just dumps it into the ed fund right okay we voted on that like yes that. I'd love to know what you we, we voted zero. to find that amendment not favorable on 11 zero okay. and I just said in my hand too that just an update for those that on the 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 newest fiscal mm -hmm. note on um, the board cost over three years so we'll have that on our desk from ways and means but um, I don't know if we need to hear from the sponsor uh, if we do, we can wait, but um, otherwise I would um, move that we find the Beck Amendment unfavorable. I don't, maybe it's not even for us to, it's an appropriation of money, so maybe it's. So it's a it's a data point that might come up, and so I think it's fine for us to straw poll it, it because it was an amendment to the work mm -hmm. that the Appropriations Committee did, we presented it there. Um, so if Jim's motion is to find Beck Unfavorable. So yes means no. Do you find the Beck amendment unfavorable? All right. Do you find it favorable? Are you abstaining? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's it's lunchtime. <laughs> Sugar levels. Yes, seems no work. Reasons. All right. No, it's so, uh, my, I made the motion to make it unfavorable, uh, which. Not we don't like it. We don't want the amendment. I mean, it, it'll just get put into the education fund, and who knows where it goes. I think right. is what yeah. the appropriations this, this kind of look <coughs> yeah. at. It goes into that big pot of money, which can always use more, but it will get lost. Right. So, right. So, if, if you vote yes, it's going to go into the education fund, and if you vote no, it's going where? No, if no. you vote yes, it's not going, it's going into the after school program. Right, and that's what I like. Okay, okay. so you, you're then voting you, yes. You're with everybody else. I want to make sure I have the right one.